cost us money um, in the long term. Water lettuce was introduced um, both intentionally and accidentally in the 1980s, and we spent a large amount of effort and money on uh, initial chemical control, and uh, some dams are still not under control, although the flood a few weeks ago did at least clear the surface, but this is an ongoing problem, and, and we don't really have a permanent solution, except in some water bodies where we managed to get some impoundments cleared through the use of the the um, snout weevil, um, the water lettuce snout weevil. But when we started searching a little bit more deeply, we found some species like this, uh, Kalanko, or Mother of Millions, um, that, was, that were planted in a number of rockeries or gardens around the park. Uh, it's a very pretty plant, but you can see it makes numerous plantlets on every single um, stem basically and it had started running out, got through the fence and it was heading into the field. Fortunately, we think we've managed to stop it um, in, in all the cases that we knew of. Another species, coral creeper that was, um, we found here in Skakuza, was literally climbing over the garden fence and trying to get to the stream that flows between the staff village um, and the camp and heading into the Sabia River. So we've got a long history of really bad species and um, some new ones that we, we know um, we're trying to escape. So we realized we have to get a better understanding with what we're dealing with, and we started doing surveys in the 1990s. We started with Skakuza and then started moving through uh, the different camps uh, in the park. So after doing some of those surveys, we realized we have to now start finding a way to, to resolve this. It's been coming for a long time. We've had limited success in controlling ornamentals. Um, but in the beginning, I was extremely naive. And I thought we would get support for this, and there was robust resistance, um, to say the least. We needed to increase the awareness um, to make, so that people could really understand why we needed to get some, rid of some of these species. So we put a lot of effort into that, and we put in place a policy. Now, there had been policy statements made, but we needed to put in uh, place some, some rules to govern how we could actually go about this. So the first was based on the, the, con the conservation of agricultural resources. That's a list of legislated species. These were prohibited in the park, have to be removed, and then we had a few other species. And the idea was that over time the camps would start self-regulating, self-managing the problems, and um, we would assist staff in the, in the, the, the gardens with, by removing the species, but then uh, providing discounted uh, plants from the, the nursery. So we started with that for a few years, then in the new regulations came into place, the Biodiversity Act, the Alien Species Regulations. This has a lot more species listed on it, so it, it, the list grew quite considerably. Um, in fact, there's, there's so many species on that, there, we can never hope to manage all of those um, plants on that list, but we have put them in the, in the list as uh, prohibited species and then a shorter list of what we call Kruger regulated, so species we have in the park that we're a little bit worried about, um, but are not yet in the legislation. But did it work? Um, we, we often don't take the time to reflect on what we've done to see if we've achieved anything, and we've spent a lot of money and effort over a long time uh, implementing this program. Uh, were we successful? Um, what did we achieve? What did we learn? Other than people really don't like to have their gardens cleared from their um, long history of um, ornamentation and cultivation. Um, and it takes a lot of effort to explain to people why we need to do that. And then where to next? So wh what's the next step? So I'm going to going to talk on some work that we finished up last year that um, looks at the initial surveys that we did that uh, we published um, around 2007, 2008, and the species list we had then, and um, 
some surveys that we did recently. So we went back to all those camps, or we, um, one of the, um, all the, all the gardens were, were resurveyed in the tourist camps, uh, excluding the natural areas. So we were fo solely focused on what's growing in um, areas where people can plant them. Um, and we used categories, three categories, the legislated species, the Kruger listed, and then unregulated, which are all alien that should not be here, uh, should not have been introdu introduced, but are not perhaps prior priority species. There are a few caveats, um, however, the time to do the surveys, in our first surveys we were doing them a lot more quickly because we wanted clearing teams to move in. Um, in this case we had two postdocs that had the, the luck of driving through the park and walking through the camps and gardens surveying um, the species so they could do it a lot more intensively. But also we have no abundance data, it's species list, so one plant is a record. So in 2000, if we found it, a garden full of alien plants and we managed to remove all of it except for one plant, it still shows up as present now. Um, so that is a, 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 a challenge, but we, we don't have any data to support um, that. So what did we find? Total species richness in the past, around 230 species. Um, and in the survey, 438 species, and that looks pr uh, pretty disappointing. And um, in almost all the camps, except for a couple, which actually went down, we found um, a, a larger increase. What was um, pleasing to see is that we got over 100 uh, species were not observed again from the initial um, record. So we had made some headway, actually, in, in, on those species. If we look at the national legislations, which, which were actually our priority targets, um, because those have to be removed, we managed to get it down from over 70 to um, 42 species. And um, so we, we, we managed to make a fairly good headway there. The locally regulated species, a fairly short list, um, species we didn't think we would get um, under control. But what was more um, reassuring was that we managed to get some of them completely out of the park, but those that still remain, we managed to get um, only, uh, we managed to get rid of them from a l large number of camps. For example, uh, one of the species um, was in 10 camps, and we now um, have it down to only four camps, and it's not very widespread in those camps. So um, even though that number went up, Overall, uh, I mean, it stayed the same. We did seem to make some progress. And then the, the unregulated species is where the story changed a bit. We went, um, I think it nearly doubled, or um, up to 388 species. So, but there's a number of reasons. One of that was the survey intensity, I think, and also a number of food species. So we didn't focus as much on that in the first survey, but of course now in the second one, we're the guys were more comprehensive, and those are species we're not necessarily worried about. Uh, we, we'll look at which ones are potentially invasive, but um, those species are, are allowed. So overall, the picture doesn't look too, too great, but we have made some progress with, in some of the camps um, with some of the species. If we look at the number, number of camps in which an ornamental species occurs, and we separated out the, the regulated species. You can see how uh, many of them there were in um, the first survey, and um, through the control, uh, um, have managed to get it down to a, a lot lower number compared to the unregulated species, which we had um, a lot fewer um, camps with each of the species and that has just increased. So this is where we need to now put in a lot of um, focus. So in conclusion, have we succeeded? Well, the total alien species richness has increased. Um, that's not the most encouraging sign, although there are some encouraging aspects to it. Um, but the listed and regulated alien species have um, decreased and the richness per camp has decreased and we're, and we're fairly 
uh, pleased about that. So we have made some headway there, but there's still more work to be done. So therefore, overall, we think that the regulations are proving effective, but it's a slow process. Um, it's been two decades, and it'll probably be an, uh, another two decades before we can really say we've um, got on top of all these, these alien plants. So um, thank you to all the funders. Thanks to the park that have spent a lot of effort and um, time removing the plants. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, Llewellyn. We don't have time for questions. Um, so we'll be moving on to Wesley. Um, we'll be predicting future spread of invasive species in the park using some modeling. Thank you, Wesley. Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Wesley Douglas, and today we're going to be talking a bit about predicting future spread of invasive species across this beautiful Kruger National Park using multi-site generalized dissimilarity modeling. So I am an MSc candidate. My supervisors are Professor Kang Hui and Dr. Sandra McFadden. Uh, my co-supervisors and collaborators are uh, Dr. Christoph Patella, Dr. Pietro Lundi, and our previous speaker, Dr. Llewellyn Foxcroft. So I'm part of a team at Stellenbosch University, the biomathematics team, which is a very nice and robust team consisting of ecologists and mathematicians, among others. And that really gives us a nice um, multidisciplinary approach to ecology and modeling. So to begin, we need data, right? So we have data on 189 invasive species. We have um, invasive celebrities such as the man-made weed lantana, the biohazard that is prickly pears, and uh, the common cocklebur. Now it's interesting to note there that another, uh, another student in our group is doing um, his presentation on deep learning or machine learning methods, deep learning methods, to identify Xanthium strumarium here in the park. And I mean, you should look forward to it because um, with the rise of Chad GPT and other AI models at the moment, it's a white hot topic. And the implementation that, um, by methods such as those in an ecological sense is a part of the future and you can't ignore it. So what we did is we divide the Kruger into, um, the Kruger is two million hectares, we divide it into two kilometer cells, and then we have predictors. We have uh, 22 predictors, you know, your usual stuff, enhanced vegetation index, temperature, fires, water, standard deviation. Then we have some interesting ones, such as distance to the boundaries, the distance to rivers, the distance to tar roads and camps. So let's do a bit of uh, visualization first. So there's a Kruger with the boundaries there. Red dots indicate invasive alien species. This is the total across the spatial temporal um, time frame. Uh, the blue are our rivers. So let's take that bottom part of the Kruger and uh, see what, those, what, what I meant by a two by two kilometer grid or a spatial grain of two kilometers. So that's what it looks like. And just for interest's sake, did a little bit of a heat map quick to see where, um, where the invasive species are most dense there at uh, Skakuza. It's obviously a hot point. Now, uh, whether that is due to sampling efforts or the f uh, maybe the fact that they are keenly aware that we are holding this very s network meeting, talking about how we're going to monitor and manage them. So yeah, tinfoil hats aside, Let's quickly talk about alpha and um, beta diversity. So we know about alpha diversity, diversity of the species within a single site or habitat. Then we know about beta diversity, the species composition changes from one location to another. So what's the problem here? Does, do they paint the full picture of what is happening with regards to compositional turnover? Well, most certainly they do not. Because when we look at what is happening about pairwise compositional change. Um, alpha diversity, for example, does not account for changes in species composition. And beta diversity don't tell us about the mechanisms that drive the differences in species composition, right? So what are we to do? Well, let's look at more sites, right? 
So we have alpha diversity, beta diversity, but what about three sites? What about four sites, five sites? What about 100 sites more? How do we do that? If we take beta diversity, it's going to take one site and compare it to a bunch of other sites, which is, I mean, it tells us a lot, obviously, and it's great, but let's look at what we can do to improve here. That's where zeta diversity comes in. It aims to capture all the diversity components. So, it aims to capture all the diversity components produced by assemblage partitioning. And it accounts for the different contributions to compositional turnover of narrow-ranged versus widespread species. So, wh what is it? Zeta diversity is just the mean number of species shared by a given number or order of sites. So we know what it is now. Let's revisit our little Venn diagrams here. So we know that it's the mean number of species shared by a given order of sites. So alpha diversity is equal to zeta order one. Beta diversity is zeta order two. Um, zeta order three, zeta order four, zeta order five for those sites, so on and so forth. So now, let's quickly revisit this grid map of ours. Just to take home the point that, listen, these sites that we're looking at, where we're talking about three, four, five, a hundred sites, they don't need to be of a fixed point origin where they're adjacent or it's rows or it's something like that. I mean, they can look, let's take zeta order five, they can look like this, or like this, or like this. So, in summation, zeta diversity and analyzes the different contributions that drive compositional turnover of narrow-ranged versus widespread species. And this is important to note, it's narrow-ranged versus widespread species. So, let's start with some results. We look here at the zeta diversity decline. So on the y-axis, we have our value of zeta diversity, the mean number of species said by an assemblage of sites. At the bottom, we have the order, just as we've seen, zeta order one, two, and so forth. So when we look at this, it's obviously declining, right? But that makes sense because the more sites you compare, the less of the likelihood that there's going to be species that are in common in those sites. So it should decline. But what's interesting to note here is when we ran through our data, I just did it for zeta order one to 10 just to visualize it nice. We can see here, zeta order one, that is the species richness, right? Our amount of species was found to be something about 3.4 per site. And the dotted lines are the standard deviation. We have a standard deviation of about 5.74. So now we can see this decline. And here at zeta order two, beta diversity, we can see that it's already below one. So what that means is, is the likelihood that they're gonna find any species in common um, for more than two sites, it's, 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 it's not likely at all. So, let's continue. So now we saw the decline, and we've seen what zeta is and what it does. How can we look um, at what the predictors do? What are the predictors telling us about compositional turnover? And that's where MSGDM comes in, finding the drivers of invasives. So, multi-site generalized dissimilarity modeling, it's a statistical leak, inspired by generalized dissimilarity modeling, GDM, and it follows the same principles as GDM, which I assume a lot of you are familiar with. So you're gonna ask, why not just use GDM instead? Well, GDM is biased to describing narrow-ranged species composition, right? And MSGDM can consider both narrow and widespread, as well as um, look at it in more detail with regards to the predictors over a larger assemblages of sites. So just, just to put it this way, MSGDM is to zeta diversity what GDM is to beta diversity. So let's look at this. This is what it looks like, right? These are called spines. It's just a statistical method that um, I assume a lot of people are also aware of, but I'm not going to get into statistics because I want to just look at it from an ecological point of view. What is this telling us? Well, here we have on the x-axis is just the... Um, the contribution, um, the relative maximum is the contribution to that compositional turnover, and the slope of these splines indicate to us how much of a contribution it's making at a certain range. Because we can see here the range is rescaled between zero and one, 
And what that does is it gives us a nice little um, way to indices this by low, mid, and high. And what I mean by that is let's quickly look at this. So here's distance, right, in blue. So here we can see that distance is a very big predictor. So is the um, summation, the total sum of EVI. And here we have that um, distance, especially in the short range for narrow range species. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. This is for narrow range species, so basically beta diversity. The distance is a massive predictor, especially for this lower range over here. And that makes sense, right? Because when you can compare two of those sites, uh, distance is a massive predictor because as you'll see in the next slide, when we up the zeta order and compare more sites, distance doesn't seem to play a role anymore. But what's happening here is that that, EV, that EVI sum here at the end, especially at the high range here, with that slope indicates that at the, high ranges, um, at the higher ranges of that EVI, it has a bigger contribution to compositional turnover than almost anything, especially at the, at the higher range here. And then we also have the mean temperature, which is more interesting because at the lower to mid range, the mean temperature is more important than that EVI sum. So we've seen uh, narrow spread to such. Let's look at um, widespread. So here again, exactly as we thought, if we look at the distance, distance doesn't play a role here. Because that makes sense, right? You've got a bunch of these sites, and the distance just doesn't matter when you start to compare them because it, it's, it's similar to, the, to some of the talks yesterday where they talked about biomes, right, where you uh, plot temperature versus um, rainfall and such. That those are much bigger predictors of what's happening. So here we can see that the mean temperature from the low, oh, so mean temperature and the EVI sum are very high predictors for widespread species. But the mean temperature here is all the way from the lower to the middle range. It gives, um, has a much greater uh, contribution to compositional turnover. So yes, in conclusion, zeta diversity is the computation of a broad range of existing, zeta diver or existing diversity metrics. It's the quantification of continuous change in biodiversity over landscapes. And MSGDM, as we have just seen, ex um, extracts the drivers responsible for uh, different stages of plant invasion dynamics. And from an ecological viewpoint, zeta diversity, the computation thereof, has a broad range of um, metrics that we can use um, within, within this toolbox of ours. So as I've um, noted before once that um, alpha and beta diversity are like a screwdriver and a hammer in our toolbox, right? They're good tools, they're very useful. But zeta diversity can kind of be like our Swiss army knife. It, it can do a lot. So yes, um, we, we looked at MSGDM and how it uh, extracts the drivers responsible for, for different um, ranges of, uh, different stages of plant evasion dynamics. And yes, uh, thank you so very much for your time. Uh, I appreciate being here. It's, uh, it's such a privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wesley. You do have a bit of time for one short question, if anyone does have. No? OK. <laughs> Thanks so much, Wesley. Um, next up, we have our junior scientist uh, here in scientific services, Kinsanin Kuna. Um, and she'll be, giving, she'll be talking about the risk analysis framework um, about the risks posed by alien grasses in South Africa. Thank you, Kinsani. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Tasha. I'm Kinsani, and today I'm going to be talking about the risk posed by alien grasses to South Africa, combining literature, species distribution modeling, and field impact assessment in a formal risk analysis framework. So grasses are among the largest plant families, and they've been introduced around the world for their uh, high economic values. They provide the most consumed staple food, which is cereal grain. They are valuable in agriculture as a pasture for livestock. They are used in the production of alco alcoholic beverages, and they are used during active restoration of uh, degraded lands, and they are also uh, valued as ornamentals. 
However, some alien grasses can cause detrimental negative impacts on the recipient environment, leading to loss of uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. So for instance, um, grasses such as Andropogon guyanus, the gambas grass, have been reported to have caused a major impact on tropical savannas of uh, Australia. Andropogon guyanus have um, changed the fire regime of uh, those ecosystems by increasing fires, intensities, and frequencies, and it has out outcompeted the native understory plant species and altered the structure of those ecosystems as seen in those two pictures taken in the, at the um, Mary River National Park. Similarly, grasses such as uh, Bromus tectorum have invaded a large part of the United States, causing a reduction in native biodiversity and um, uh, productivity of the rangelands and, and increasing fires there as well. So South Africa has its own share of alien grasses. One notable alien grass is Syncras cetaceus, which is which was introduced into the country for ornamental purposes and is now problematic in the Fynbos and the um, Karoo. It causes impacts through competitions with native uh, plants, increasing fire fuel loads, and uh, gradually uh, altering the functioning of those um, ecosystems. So, however, when comparing um, alien grasses to other plant families. Alien grasses have received um, very little attention here in South Africa, and because of this, uh, little is known about them here in the country and where they occur, and only a few of them are regulated for management. So the first review on alien grasses was done by Sue Milton in 2004, and where she looked at alien grasses as invasives, and that review was later revisited by uh, Visa et al. in 2017. So from those two uh, papers, we have an inventory of alien grasses occurring in the country, which is more than 250 species, with only 16 of them regulated for management. In the, in the latest 2020 uh, National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act. We now also have an idea how these alien grasses are introduced here in South Africa. The potential impact of most of them also have been quantified using impact records from elsewhere. However, little work has been done on the actual impact of these uh, grasses here in the country. And we also um, have little knowledge about their current distribution and their invasion status. All of these unknown factors are important for their control and management here in South Africa in order to uh, mitigate future impacts here in the country. So although it is not possible to acquire all the information needed for their management, uh, lack of scientific certainties cannot be used as a reason to postpone or fail to take appropriate um, uh, control measures. So in this study, we explore a multifaceted approach of combining data from different sources in order to fill the gaps and better understand their risk. So to do this, we focus on a recently introduced grass, which is Pasvalum quadrifarium, and combine literature, species distribution modeling, and a field impact assessment in a formal risk analysis. So Paspalum quadrifarium is an invasive perennial grass uh, native to parts of uh, South America. It is a large, beautiful, bluish-green tufted grass um, that can reach up to 1.8 uh, meters in height. It was firstly recorded in South Africa around 2003-2004, and um, uh, sorry. However, we are not sure how it was introduced, but it is suspected that it was introduced as an ornamental as done in other intro, um, introduced ranges. And it is currently listed under uh, category 1A in the NEMBA regulations of 2020. So as a first step in understanding the risk posed by Pasvalum quadrifarium to South Africa, a systematic literature review was conducted on its ecology, its global um, distribution, the likelihood of spread, its potential environmental and socioeconomic impact, its benefits, as well as um, options available for its control. 
So the literature was searched on uh, Web of Science as well as Google Scholar, and the papers were selected based on the relevance on the, um, the title and the abstract of those papers. So for the literature, we found that Paspalam quadrifarium is known to occur in the KwaZulu Natal province only here in South Africa. We found no record of, of it in our neighboring countries, and um, which indicates its low probability of entry into South Africa via unaided pathways. Paspalam quadrifarium is also not sold in uh, Nazareth, and as mentioned, it is listed under category 1A, which indicates its low in economic value here in South Africa. So literature also indicates that Paspalam quadrifarium is considered an ecosystem engineer, as shown, oh, sorry, as shown in this picture taken in its uh, native range, which is something that is not desirable for South African um, ecosystems. So it is also not palatable and provides very nutritional uh, um, value for livestock. Paspalam flowers uh, twice a year and produces vi viable seeds and um, exposure to fire can assist in the spread and the survival of the plant. So the plants also spread rapidly through rhizomes and can form dense infestations. The highest impact ever recorded for Paspalam was through competition with native species. And um, so this kind of information can be used to identify key factors that contribute to the invasiveness of Paspalam quadrifarium in South Africa and has been fed into a formal risk analysis framework. And I'm going to um, discuss the results of, those from, of that framework later. After the review, we conducted a species distribution modeling using uh, the Maxen package in R, and we modeled the potential distribution of Paspalum quadrifarium using occurrence data from both the native and introduced range, and the data was obtained from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility Database. And five bioclimatic variables uh, obtained from the TeamMod um, Bioclimatic Database were selected. We also used uh, road density and population density to account for sampling bias. So we only found 64 occurrences of Paspalam quadrifarium globally that we could use for the modeling. And occurrence data for South Africa was only recorded in one area where it currently occurs. And therefore, Predictions are largely in extrapolated environmental space. We also found a high variability. We also found a high variability in our in our model, which is indicated by the middle um, uh, map, and. Uh, Given these provisions, uh, areas of high um, suitabilities were only found around the drunken around the drunken backs areas and in the very south of the country, which indicates why Paswaram quadrifarium is limited to uh, the one area that, it, that, that is found currently. So the area in which the species is known to occur, which is here in the Melmoth area in the KwaZulu Natal, looks like it has a um, relatively low suitability uh, in overall. Lastly, we conducted a field impact assessment to determine the impact of Paspalam quadrifarium on local uh, community. So we firstly conducted a botanical survey um, in a site where Paspalam quadrifarium is abundant, where it has been removed, and finally in a site where it, has not, it was not found. We then established 35 3 by 3 uh, meter quadrants randomly in each site and estimated the percentage cover of species within each quadrant. The data was then analyzed using generalized linear lantern variable model. From the botanical survey, we found plant species in the invaded site. We found 53 plant species in the invaded site, 41 in the uninvaded site, and 43 in the site where Paspalam quadrifarium was cleared. So this plot shows the species um, composition results where each point represents a quadrant, and quadrants that are clustered together 
um, represents uh, show that the species uh, composition shows similarities in species uh, composition. There is little overlap in species composition between the cleared and um, the cleared and the invaded site. But when we zoom into those quadrants, we see that this is influenced by the presence of other uh, alien species that occur in both sites, indicating um, invasion on the secondary invasion on the clearing site. We also found little to no regrowth of Paspalum quadrifarium in the cleared site after four years of clearing, which can mean one of three things. Um, firstly, that the uh, clearing efforts were successful, or that secondary invasion uh, occurred before uh, Paspalum quadrifarium could regrow, or that uh, because fire has been excluded in the area and is a role player in uh, breaking the domestic of the Paspalum species, um, that's why there hasn't been a regrowth. So the field study therefore indicates that Paspalum quadrifarium in, uh, accounts for much of the change in, com in community composition across um, its invasion gradient. So the findings of the systematic review and the species distribution modeling and the impact studies were then used to analyze the risk of PASPALAM within a, a formal risk analysis framework. The risk analysis framework is basically a tool used to transparently provide uh, scientific evidence for the management of alien species under the NIMBA regulations. So the framework is divided into three main sections which is the risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication. And uh, the risk assessment section is formed by two main components, uh, which are the likelihood of the species to become invasive and the negative impacts caused by the species. This is where the results of the species distribution modeling and the field um, uh, study was, were used. The risk management section looks at uh, the traits of the species of the species that would make management inherently uh, difficult and also looks at the benefits that the species has. And then the risk communication uh, section provides a background on the species as well as communicate the results of the other two sections. So with the risk analysis, we found that Paspalum quadrifarium is a high risk species for South Africa with little to no economic or environmental benefit. We also found that it will be difficult to manage Paspalum quadrifarium due to, its to, due to the persistence of its propagul, um, the accessibility of the population, and its short time to, re to reproduction. It is therefore recommended to regulate Paspalum quadrifarium and develop a national management plan. So although our species distribution uh, indicate a relatively low suitability of Paspalum quadrifarium in South Africa, we suspect that its current distribution has been contained in that area because fire has been excluded. We uh, recommend the prevention of its spread in fire-driven ecosystems such as um, the savannas because it is fire adapted. We therefore also recommend that it should be eradicated here in the country as per the number um, listings. In conclusion, risk posed by alien grasses to South Africa might be underestimated due to data and information poesity. A comprehensive approach is therefore required in order to make sound management decisions under such a circumstance. So combining literature, species distribution modeling, and a field impact study in a risk analysis framework can provide a holistic understanding of the risk posed by these groups of plants, and this approach will also ensure that um, management interventions are adequately informed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kinsani. There's no time for questions. Um, so we'll be moving over to a five-minute speed talk by Tulisili Jata. Yes. As I practiced earlier, and I got it right, but then I got nervous. Um, so she'll be talking about the threat of cactus um, invasions in our northwest uh, parks and reserves. Thank you, Tulisili. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, uh, uh, colleagues. As I've been introduced, my name is Tulisi Lejaka, and I'm going to talk um, about some work that we've been doing on the cactus invasion threats in the Northwest Park Sport. So uh, we, we all know that nature reserves are, are globally, you know, are threatened by uh, alien invasive species, and South Africa is of no exception. And uh, invasion in the nature reserves by these species result in ecological succession where new invaders will establish themselves and outcompete with um, native vegetation. The most uh, cost-effective management of you know, these species is to um, actually um, prevent the invasions before they occur, the meaning uh, controlling them at the very early stages of their estab establishment. So this was part of our reasons why we conducted this work. We also wanted to know, you know, those species that are not yet well established in, the, in their reserves. So um, Northwest, in Northwest alone, there are about, um, you know, 23 species of cacti that are known to be uh, either invasive or, or, or naturalized and they distributed just across the, the province. And, um, you know, uh, oh, th this, so some of these species would definitely okay in, uh, or encroach into the nature reserves where they will uh, uh, threaten um, natural vegetation as well as the well-being of the, the game animals in these reserves. Um, so they are about uh, 14 reserves uh, uh, in parks across the province distributed in in the in all the the four districts as we can we can see here and um they they are i mean we, we all know that northwest is a, a agricultural province and also a mining province and therefore these reserves they are the only uh, pristine and, and natural areas that you will find in the in the in the province in the northwest. Therefore, our aim uh, in this study was to document uh, cacti invasion, cactus invasions, uh, uh, cactus invasion patterns uh, across the the nature reserves and the parks. So we surveyed reserves, um, all the reserves, uh, uh, using um, stratified random sampling where we. Uh, defined um, these. Um, uh, we, we defined some of the of, of this strata, and uh, our results indicate that you no know, grassland um, uh, had the most species. You know, followed by um, your savanna that's under canopy, and the and the roadside tracks. And in terms of species composition, um, uh, botanalo, uh, babaspian, and mafikeng. Uh, contributed the most, and as, as expected, um, a lot of species were uh, coming from the uh, genus Opuntia, and most interestingly, um, the, in terms of the uh, number categories, we found, you know, uh, quite uh, two, two uh, category 1A species across the reserves, but uh, these species were not known before um, we, we conducted this work. This is just some of the species that um, were, were recorded in the, in the parks. So, um, you know, uh, in summary, you know, the number of uh, records uh, in the grasslands suggests that, you know, animals uh, uh, might, be the, might, might be the vectors uh, that spread uh, these cacti uh, in, in within the reserves. And the high abundance of Category 1B species was expected. However, you know, um, none of these have managed former management programs, although, you know, in one or two reserves, you might find that there is a biocontrol program or, or so. However, it, it is not a, a former um, um, program. Therefore, we, we hope that this information will assist the managers in developing the management plans or eradication um, plans for the cactus species and also other um, uh, invasive species uh, within the reserves. And we, we recommend that, you know, continued surveillance in these 
um, uh, natural areas uh, uh, it need to be intensified to assist, uh, you know, in eradicating uh, emerging uh, alien species. And uh, finally, uh, we, we also recommend an integrated management of cacti in the, in the reserves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tulisili. We don't have time for any questions. So we'll be moving over to Ellen Wood's talk on a rust fungus as a biocontrol agent for Cardiospermum grandiflorum. Thanks, Ellen. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a little bit like a fish out of water in this group. Um, I would work with real prob solving problems, not identifying them. Okay, I'm talking about a rust fungus, Paxinia erichevalaiti, which I considered as a candidate for uh, biocontrol of the balloon vine, um, Cardiospermum grandiflorum, in the Sapindaceae from South America. Um, and I'd just like to say that I'm speaking specifically within the context of classical biocontrol agents that is using co-evolved species from the land of origin of the alien, um, introducing if safe to do so. Most of our work being testing that it will be safe to do so by host specificity testing. Balloon vine itself is a invader back in the uh, 90s, early 2000s. We stopped looking only at major weeds and started looking at some of the more emerging weeds. Um, Cardiospermum being one of them, um, quite widely distributed through South Africa, but not too bad, but certainly you can see that it's associated with higher rainfall areas. And it, when it gets in, it's quite capable of climbing up, smothering in, in vegetation. This is in Durban, which is a hellhole of weeds. It's, no worth, it's not worthwhile visiting, um, simply because there's everything, balloon, vine, Syringa, bugweed, I, f I find Durban very depressing. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so we started looking for biocontrol agents. This involved doing surveys in country of origin. We particularly focused in Argentina where we had cooperative agreements with Fuerde there. They helped us. The net result of this was that there was one agent released. This is the seed feeding um, uh, weevil um, that was released and has been spread and it feeds on the developing fruit and it's having quite an impact. Then I myself with a colleague Andres Ferri, we looked at um, the rust fungus. Um, so we did a lot of work on its biology and its host range. This is the fungus on the leaves here. My personal opinion was this is the best agent I've ever worked with, and I was very, very keen to get it out. So this is a little bit about the rust fungus. So these are obligate biotrophic fungi. In other words, they only work, they're parasites of living plants. They die if the host dies. This is what it looks like. You get these circles of the telia on the undersurface. The telia are basically the the teliospores, which is the sexual stage of the fungus. Rust fungi have up to five different spore stages. Um, the ancestral stage is to be on two separate hosts, which is why there's so many spore stages to allow for alteration between hosts. But in tropic southern hemisphere, um, a major trend has been to only be on one host and to simplify the, the life cycle. So this one is down to only the teliospores. This is, if you look at, so each of those little brown dots represents a couple of thousand teliospores. These are them under the microscope. Notice the uh, 10 micrometer uh, scale. When they germinate, they produce um, metabasidia with four basidiospores, so the result of meiosis, very typical. These basidiospores are what are the dispersal structures. They land on the host under suitable environmental conditions, so right temperature, right uh, with free water available. 
penetrate directly through epidermal cells, then develop within the leaves, and this is the development of symptoms on a weekly basis, so week one, two, three, and if you've got sufficient uh, pustules, the leaves just die, drop off, and this knocks the plant back tremendously. So, as I said, a lot of the work that we do with classical agents is host specificity testing. This is where we take plants that are related to the weed, relevant to the country. So, in other words, in this case, indigenous Sapindaceae, we got as, I got as many sp species within the indigenous Sapindaceae as possible and tested them. None were susceptible except for two Cardiospermum species. Um, Cardiospermum corundum, and then there's this interesting one from the Namib Desert, Cardiospermum petueli. Initially, everybody said corundum is an invader, it's not a problem, this would not be a problem. Um, but then there were some things in the literature that kept saying, but it's indigenous. So there was a question as to, is Cardiospermum indigenous to Southern Africa, or is it an alien invader? Um, as you can see, this is from GBIF. The distribution of Cardiospermum corundum is basically throughout the tropics subtropics. In South Africa, it has been described as a species Cardiospermum alatum. It was described from Somalia as Cardiospermum canescent, and apparently the Indians are adamant that what they have is Cardiospermum canescent and not Cardiospermum corundum. Um, so there, there's a lot of... So the um, net result is we were uncertain whether this was indigenous or not, and the general rule in classical biocontrol is if there's any indigenous species or crop plant that is susceptible to the plant, you do not release the agent. That's the basic rule that we work on. We are highly risk averse. We don't want any political fallout. So I destroyed the culture in 2012 um, to wait for someone to come along and help and resolve this problem. That help came in the form of Angela Gildenhays, who was a student of Yaka LaRue at CBC, so CIB in Stellenbosch. And she did a very interesting uh, masters with these publications. From this one, part of what she did was she looked at the phylogeny. And for corundum, which is up here, in red is specimens collected by Andres from South America. And in black are all the Southern African specimens, as well as uh, Corundum petueli. And as you can see, there's a distinct phylogenetic difference between South American Corundum and African Corundum, with interestingly petueli nested right within those Corundums. In contrast, Grandiflorum, really didn't make much difference. There was no difference at all between African, South American, Australian. The only ones that were slightly different were Hawaiian, um, probably a founder effect. So this is definitely invasive. Basically invasive means introduced during or after colonial times. Things that were spread around the world or spread around the world prior to colonial times generally was considered indigenous. Although that in itself is an interesting question. Um, when do you call something indigenous? But certainly the, the, what out of this is that there is starting to be diversification and so the African is different to the South American. Is it yet at a species level? We don't know. That's, I'm not a clever um, evolutionary biologist. But basically the, ex the conclusion they came to is that Following a natural extreme long distance dispersal effect, um, Cardiospermum corundum arrived in southern Africa and is diversifying genetically from South American stock. Interestingly, in support of that, the African corundum is susceptible to any um, isolate of Cardiospermum of Paxinia arachivillati. Whereas in South America, Cardiospermum corundum is not susceptible to the Grandiflorum 
or for instance, other ones from other genera like Soyana. Okay, I see I'm speeding through a lot. Okay, um, this is just, this is the distribution of corundum in southern Africa. As you can see, generally speaking, it's associated with dry areas coming from Namibia through Botswana into the dry areas of northern southern Africa. This is the distribution of grandiflorum, uh, largely distributed in the wet areas. This area here where Kruger Park is, is nicely where the two come together. So remember, I had destroyed my culture in 2012, but then in 2018, my colleagues David Simolani and Katani Mawela sent me photographs of the rust fungus on plants in the southern KZN, um, which was a bit of a surprise. Um, I'd been wanting to get it out. Um, You can talk on this mic. <laughs> do I carry on talking or do I... Um, is the slide still working? Okay, so I, I can just carry on with my talk. Okay, so in 2019, early in 2019, I went out with David and Catania on separate trips looking for where the rust had got to and Within, it was basically everywhere. So within this area, we had from down here in uh, uh, Nelspray, Tazy View, all the way up to Zanin Louis Trichot. Um, so in other words, within a year, this rust fungus having got in, spread throughout the entire distribution of its host in just one, one year, which is quite amazing. Um, that obviously brought up the whole question about, well, what about Cardiospermum corundum? Now that we consider it indigenous, is this rust fungus going to impact on populations of corundum itself? Um, so we went looking for suitable populations, and so we've got Potlaki uh, here near the Sotbansberg and Mapungubwe, and then Kruger Park, my favorite, we have these I've got a lovely transect all the way through the park. Um, means I can go and look at fungi while avoiding elephants. Um, so 2022, last year, this is when I really started. Prior to last year, I had not found the fungus on corundum anywhere. Last year, I came and I surveyed here in the park. Um, so. This is the plant in the park, so this is what it looks like. It's rather a strappy little creeper. Not really, nothing nice to look at. Um, interesting, but I found the rust. Um, and if you look at my results, so in blue, these are all the sites outside of, these are the sites outside of the park. Didn't find anything, Mapungubwe, Potlaki, um, these are generally drier than the Kruger, I didn't find anything, but in the park, throughout the park, I found um, plants. So basically what my survey was, I looked at, were there any um, infections on a plant? If there was, I recorded it. Um, the plants, so that is whole plant uh, incidents. And then I looked at, within plants, 10 random samples, 10 consecutive leaves, just counting the number of leaves with infections. I'm not looking at severity. I can't do that with only a once a year survey. In effect, I found the rust on 43% of all the plants I looked at. Approximately 15% of leaves on those plants were infected, but overall there were only about 4%. So it was very widespread, um, but, um, but not many, uh, but not that much at all. And if you look at last year, possible explanation as we had yesterday, last year was an unusual year. So, sorry, a little bit back. The previous year and last year's rain seasons were very good ones. They are higher than average rainfall. And last year was an extremely long season, unusually long. This is the, the that's the average long-term um, rainfall. 
So that obviously had an impact of allowing the rust to go for it for as long as possible. So in conclusion, just to sum up the story, Paxini Arachivalati was a good candidate for cardiosperm grandiflorum biocontrol, but in host spec testing, cardiosperm and corindum, African corindum, and Pechueli were susceptible, therefore destroyed the culture. Um, but 2018, it was first observed in South Africa. Pathway of introduction unknown. By 2019, it was everywhere. So I started looking up and last for possible sites to survey. 2022, I started. And basically, further monitoring is going to be needed to, um, to determine whether this continues to be there or whether it's simply these wet years that it's on the plants and during normal years it's going to die off as the plant dies back during the dry summers. The importance of this is simply that um, this is a experiment, a natural experiment that I have to test whether host spec testing is the only thing that we should use in determining whether to release or not. Is it possible in certain cases to release um, a biocontrol agent or not? That's the question for, that I'm wanting to get from this. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Um, as you guys can hear, this your piece is not going to last much longer. So we're going to wait until the electricity comes back before we let Chet and, Chet and talk. But if anyone has any questions for any of the speakers so far, you can, there we go, Tony. So I hope that these of the speakers are here still, in case the questions are for them. So I was just wondering how the fungus got from KZN into Camps and Kruger. And would tourism be like a good candidate, tourist, tourist cars? Sorry, do you need, the other people need that as well. The basidia spores are the dispersal stage. They disperse during rain events, so the wind blowing with wet conditions. Um, it's quite amazing how far they can, they can travel. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Alan. Thanks, Tony. Um, Chetan, you'll be next, but I know they're still loading your talk. Um, I just want to remind everyone that if you are loading your talks, please do it in the session before your session, because um, I have some naughty delegates in my session, only loading in their session, so it delays um, the start of the, of the talk. Thanks.
Okay, guys, um, we are back in action. So the next talk is by Chet and Misha. We'll be talking about ecological invasions in Western India. Thank you, Chetan. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'll be talking about how the ecological invasion in uh, Western Indian grasslands are impacting native wildlife communities. And this is also part of my PhD work. So uh, dry tropical grasslands of India, as we have been listening uh, since yesterday, uh, that the grasslands across the world are facing a lot of issues. And uh, one major issue they're facing is their recognition as a fully functional ecosystem. That is uh, actually a bigger issue in India, as uh, these landscapes are mostly uh, categorized as a wasteland and not uh, have given a proper status of an ecosystem. And, but technically, these ecosystems are also not just a wildlife area, but are more complex socio-ecological system, where human activities on a daily basis shape the uh, each land cover type of this area in the form of uh, or through grazing uh, through different land management institution so uh, and because of this wasteland categorization and being a socio ecological system a very uh, small proportion of area is actually uh, fall under protected area and my study area basically which has two sites in the western india bunni and bikaner both of these areas are outside protected area which have a really high uh, human intervention uh, so uh, because of the narrative that grasslands are wasteland and deserts are also wasteland, uh, a lot of uh, plantation drive has happened in this landscape. And that has resulted in a significant greenification of desert and uh, grasslands area. And because of that greenification practice, the species uh, Prosopis juliflora was introduced in this landscape uh, during 1960s uh, to make desert green uh, because their idea was that uh, these are wasteland uh, unproductive areas. And the other aim for the, this plantation was also to provide livelihood to local peoples. But uh, over the time, uh, the species has uh, spread across the area. And especially in the bunny landscape, more than 50% of the landscape uh, is basically occupied by the Prosopis woodland. And the further, the second most important uh, invasive species in these areas are the dog. Since this uh, area has never been considered as a critical wildlife habitat for a very long time, so wildlife conservation has not been a priority in this area. And therefore, a lot of uh, species, actually we do not have uh, data of uh, species trend, population trends and all, but currently the dogs are the largest uh, carnivore in this landscape, spreading across these areas and interacting with uh, different wildlife species and uh, a different scale. So uh, if we uh, just conceptualizing the, how these uh, species have an might have an impact on these uh, communities, so if an invasive plants changing the landscape structure from open grasslands to dense woodlands, it might change resource availability for some species uh, in the form of uh, providing shelter for some species while providing unsuitable habitat for other species. So it may have a species specific impact. And any change in uh, species uh, distribution dynamics can further have uh, impacts in uh, cascading interactions. Further, if an uh, animal uh, an individual is being introduced in habitat, that may function as a prey, predator, or a competitor. And in any case, uh, again, uh, these species will again have an impact on native species in terms of their spatiotemporal distribution, their population. So uh, I'll be focusing on how both of these species in these landscapes are actually affecting uh, different wildlife communities. First community I'm focusing on is the small rodents. So what is the response of small rodent towards the change in habitat due to prosopis encroachment? So as uh, the prosopis encroachment changes these open grasslands into dense woodland, and this can have a repercussions in terms of uh, providing a predation uh, cover uh, for a lot of rodent species. So and uh, by, uh, by creating that shelter, they may actually have a species-specific impact on different species. So what I did was I categorized my uh, rodent sampling in five different uh, uh, habitat type. First one is the grasslands. So uh, in currently, in the bunny landscape, uh, where this study was uh, based at, uh, there are no large patches of natural grassland devoid of prosopis. So almost every uh, corner of the uh, landscape is uh, encroached by prosopis. So there have been a lot of restoration drives happen. And uh, these uh, large grassland areas have been established there after removal of the prosopis. So these grasslands actually represent the restored grassland state, not the natural grassland state uh, prior to the invasion. And the uh, second part was the uh, I categorized the prosopis plots into two categories based on their uh, pros total prosopis cover uh, into dense prosopis cover and the sparse prosopis cover, which has uh, less than 20% prosopis cover. And while the prosopis dominated area will have a uh, prosopis cover of more than 70 to 80%. 
Then the two other land cover type in the landscape is the recently started agriculture uh, practices have actually created a lot of uh, agriculture fallow land in the landscape. And the agriculture is pretty much dependent on mon uh, monsoon only. So it's a very season specific activity. Rest of the year, these areas are uh, uh, left open. And the uh, fifth category is the open shrubland. These are the relatively high saline area which have a mixed vegetation of grass and brushes. So I expected that uh, Restored grasslands will be having the highest uh, abundance of rodent compared to the dense prosopis. So uh, I focused on three parameters, uh, species composition, abundance, and activity on uh, all these uh, five different plots. And uh, what I found out was there was uh, seven species I reported. Uh, I observed during my study, uh, the three of them are the open habitat specialist species uh, in the first line, while the other four are the more generalist species found in the more bush enclosed area. And uh, my finding actually, uh, so if we see the species composition in different habitat, the agriculture fallow are totally monopolized by a single species, that is the Tatera indica. It's a generalist gerbil uh, species found across the bush enclosed area in the drylands. While the uh, prayer, Contrary to my hypothesis, grasslands and prosopis dominated area, area actually uh, shown a very similar species composition. And uh, that can be a reason, so I used the matched pair design where the restored grasslands, were actually the uh, dense prosopis plot was sampled in proximity of the restored grassland to cover the variation, uh, so it should not be uh, far away so that uh, the difference between uh, both plots uh, could be attributed to the landscape itself, therefore, the reason uh, both of uh, uh, habitat had a similar species combustion can be the site-specific uh, characteristic because all these areas are uh, in the high, relatively high productivity, high primary productivity areas. While the open brushlands were only dominated by uh, one species, which is uh, pygmy gerbil, Gerbilus nanos, and uh, while the sparse prosopis had a relatively different uh, species composition. But if you compare the abundance, uh, we see grassland had the highest abundance. Uh, of uh, different rodent species, followed by uh, followed by the dense prosopis, but this difference was not statistically significant. However, uh, the difference was statistically significant between sparse prosopis area and the grasslands, showing that initial encroachment of the prosopis might have more negative impact uh, on the community w before uh, the prosopis get established uh, as a dominant uh, vegetation type, and then they can support more generalist rodent species compared to the open habitat specialists. So uh, three most abundant uh, species in my study, uh, I st looked at their uh, daily activities also, how their daily activities actually being affected by the vegetation cover as well as moonlight and the temperature. So the first species was Tatera indica, which is an Indian gerbil. We can see that uh, the response of Tatera indica towards moonlight is actually significantly driven by the habitat cover. So in the grassland areas, as the moonlight increases, their activities goes down, while in the prosopis cover area areas, as the moonlight increases, their activities goes up, showing that uh, how uh, vegetation structure mediate their uh, activity, and it might be uh, due to because uh, these uh, prosopis cover provide them a shelter from predators, while uh, temperature also had a significant effect with the prosopis cover, but the effect size is not so great uh, to have a me ecological meaning for it, but in general trend shows that as the uh, outer uh, ambient temperature increases, uh, rodent uh, tatera indica activity under the prosopis cover goes down. But uh, interestingly, uh, so I also looked at the how the potential interaction with the competing species, which is the next uh, rodent species, Bandicoot or Bangalensis, might affect their activity. And it shows a clear negative relation with the activity of Bandicoot or Bangalensis. So here is the most generalist species, which actually did not show any significant impact, uh, if, uh, influence of any habitat cover or the moonlight or temperature. And, but it was actually uh, highly active in both grassland and prosopis dominated areas, showing that uh, if the prosopis cover increases further, generalist species may be favored by uh, this uh, expansion. And the third species was the Milardia miltata, which is a soft furred field rat. rat. And it was also highly active in the grassland compared to the prosopis dominated areas. And the moonlight and temperature showed a significant impact. Uh, higher the temperature and the lower their activity. And the higher the moonlight, again, higher their activity. This is actually uh, interesting. It can be uh, due to because this is the smallest species in the rodent guild. And uh, because there are other larger species pr presence in the area, 
uh, these species might be escaped from the predation pressure due to uh, presence of other uh, large rodent species such as Sotera indica and Bengal uh, Bandicota bengalensis. So, uh, in summary, we can say that uh, Prosopis encroachment had a very species-specific impact on rodent communities, and in general, it is uh, actually favoring the more generalist species over the specialist species. So, if the Prosopis encroachment further uh, actually uh, expand to the more drier areas, they may replace the open habitat specialist species such as uh, Pygmy gerbil and the Merionis huriana, the desert gerbil, while they may increase the uh, number of uh, more uh, general species and which are the, actually the major agriculture pest till now because of the open areas uh, the dry lands are relatively uh, safer in terms of agriculture pest but as the IPCC report uh, suggests that uh, the desert will be getting more wetter and if in that condition prosopis expansion more uh, occur in the new areas the desert may face a new uh, pest problem very soon. And the second part of my uh, work was uh, how the mesocarnivore species, especially uh, the foxes and jungle cat jackal, actually uh, respond to what these changes. But for them, uh, Prosopis is not the only uh, invasive species they'll be interacting with. Uh, there is an, uh, a really good number of free-ranging dogs in this landscape. So I was looking how both uh, Prosopis and the free-ranging dogs uh, have an impact on spatiotemporal activities of uh, mesocarnivore. So I used a simple uh, camera trap design where a camera trap were uh, actually uh, deployed uh, minimum uh, at an equal distance of two kilometers in the both areas. And uh, I sampled a to total of, okay, sorry. And the habitat composition was actually taken uh, by uh, remote sensing. So I combined the uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 images together to get a more clearer picture of the grasslands, uh, proportion of grasslands area in the habitat. And the habitat were categorized into open natural native vegetation that includes the grasslands and brushland. Then the invasive woodland, the surface, agriculture, water, and buildup. So these are the habitat variable. And then I use the occupancy modeling to uh, look how each species respond to different habitat variable. So uh, this was the multi-stage modeling. I uh, started with the modeling first detection. If uh, probability of detecting a species in the area uh, be can be affected by this variable. Then I put uh, habitat uh, model, uh, habitat variables in the model. At the end, the best habitat model was actually uh, added with the interaction of potential competis, competing species. And then I also look for the temporal activity using kernel density estimation. So I sample a total of 269 sites uh, across these areas. And I find out in the Bunny and Bikaner, uh, the species composition was a little different uh, in terms of uh, number of species found there. In Bikaner, the Indian fox was totally absent, while in the Bunny, all uh, five major uh, mesocarnivore species was found. So golden jackal had the highest uh, occupancy, uh, followed by desert cat, then jungle cat, and desert fox, and Indian fox. Indian fox was the least occurred species. So if you see uh, the response of each species to a different variable, so we see jackals were the most generalist species, but they showed a uh, scale-dependent uh, habitat response. It means that the larger scale, they do not actually respond to any habitat, but at the smaller scale, they avoid the open uh, natural vegetation. And uh, Yes, and the, the, there was no impact of competing dog on the jackal occupancy. Desert fox was found to be the most specialist species actually responding to each habitat type at a different scale. So largely, this species prefer the open natural vegetation. So as the proportion of open natural habit, uh, area increases, their occupancy increases, and significantly avoiding uh, prosopis woodland at the all scale, uh, from the homeland scale to smaller scale. And it was avoiding all the area which was occupied by dog. So it shows uh, simply if the dog and prosopis together is expanding towards the landscape, uh, the suitable area for the desert fox will be uh, reducing at a significant rate. And the Indian fox with the smallest canine in the area actually did not show any response to any habitat type, but it did show a strong response toward the jackal. And especially the fox avoided all the area where uh, dogs were occurring, and there was a positive association with the uh, uh, occupancy of jackal. It shows, so in a three canid system, basically the larger canid will suppress the population of the smaller canid. That can be benefit to a smaller uh, species in the area. So we can see that pattern in the uh, uh, Thar Desert as well. And the, in the feline, jungle cat was the most generally uh, cat species, actually showing a positive association with the woodlands and the negative association with the open natural vegetation. 
simply desert cat. Actually, because the detection probability for the desert cats was really low, so model did not predict any uh, significant uh, influence of any habitat type or any other competitive variable. But the sites where the desert fox was found has a significantly higher uh, proportion of open natural ha habitat compared to the dense woodland. But uh, model does not uh, pick that uh, variation because of the really low detection of the species. And in the temporal activities, uh, we see uh, all the species are mostly nocturnal if uh, dogs are uh, active throughout the day. And especially if you see the activity of most specialist species, desert fox, it is restricted to the 20 to 21 hour night only in the bunny landscape. While there is a wider activity in the uh, big canary landscape where there is a high abundance of dog, which is, uh, but the number of competing species available in those landscapes was really low. So if, uh, if there is less competition, uh, the species will have more time to range. And if there is high competition, uh, they'll have uh, less time to range. So these are some uh, that, uh, that activity overlay with the different species. So desert fox avoiding activity uh, overlap with the all golden jackal dog and even the grazing activities. And while the Indian fox is actually highly associated with the jackal uh, occupancy. And uh, jackal is actually uh, more generally species, actually not significantly avoiding activities or anything except the grazing activity. And both the jungle cat had a high overlap in the activity. So in general, overall, if we combine the finding of the both study, we can see that if the expansion of prosopis uh, further occurs, the uh, species composition of the dry lands can shift from a more uh, specialist species to the more generalist species. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chetan. Um, since we're trying to give some time for the guys to load the next talks, um, if there is any questions for Chetan, we can take one or two. No? Okay, lucky you. <laughs> okay, so that was the invasive species session. We're now going to be moving over to um, the cultural heritage and archaeology session right now. Um, so our first speaker for the session, C um, CP Cisle, is not here today, so that one is cancelled. Um, there are two posters in the session, one by Tim, um, and one also by Shante Bernard, which is out in the, in the foyer over there, who will be talking about the Little Mark Shelters at Mapangupwe. Um, so, I won't quite introduce you, just hold on. Okay. Yeah, we'll just let Judith do some announcements quickly. Great, thanks everybody. So, uh, just a couple of announcements. So, this afternoon the herbarium visit is shifted to Thursday, so Thursday morning. So, please, if you'd like to visit the herbarium, um, chat to Nikisha. She is around here and she's going to give a talk tomorrow just to make sure that we can sort that time out. And then tomorrow we're going to have a, a jam-packed program, so there's just some important information that I just want to relay to you guys. So firstly, the Masoy Home-based care group is going to be joining us tomorrow. So those are the ladies that have done our very nicely uh, sewed bags and lanyards. So um, they support school kids and young kids in the Numbi area by giving them um, home-cooked meals and helping them with academics and after-school um, sort of activities. So, so they're going to be in the foyer. They're going to be selling some of the other things that they're creating, so not only the bags and the lanyards. So please bring some cash and, and support that initiative. I think it's a really a good initiative um, for us all to be supporting. Then tomorrow we're going to have parallel sessions. Okay, so session one will be in here. Session two, the parallel session, will be on, in the breakaway room uh, just outside of the foyer. So those will be going on um, in the morning and until after lunch. Then immediately after the session tomorrow afternoon, we will, going in, we will be going into the poster session. So there will be snacks and some drinks in the foyer. So please um, join us for that. And then following that, we're going to have our sponsored drive and dinner. Okay, so a couple of important announcements. Please bring um, a jacket or something warm um, to go on the drive. So the buses will leave here tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Or not the buses, sorry, the game drive vehicles will leave immediately after the poster session from outside here in the parking lot. You will then have an hour-long drive followed by a dinner, a sponsored dinner, 
at the golf club. Um, so please um, join us for that. And then just a reminder, tonight's bar and the bar tomorrow night for the dinner um, will be a cash bar. For those of you that aren't staying inside the camp itself, please then also go with the night drive vehicle on the drive. After the dinner, all the vehicles will come back here to the parking lot and we will ensure that everybody that's not staying in the camp will be able to go out um, together at the gate um, to get to their accommodation. So then, importantly, everybody that goes on the drive and to the dinner tomorrow night needs to fill out an indemnity form. So Jackie has those forms already, so when you pass past there, please grab a form so that we can get those um, returned back to her tomorrow. So we will just remind people about you know the dinner tomorrow night again, but please if there's people that aren't in the audience that you know will be joining us tomorrow night, please also just relay the information to them. If you do have any questions about who's allowed to go on the drive and parking or not parking or transport, um, speak to me or Jackie, um, I can help you with that. And then just lastly, we do have the selfie frame up in the foyer, so please take selfies and post them. Great, thanks. Thank you so much, Judith. Okay, I think we are ready to go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Tim will be starting off the session um, talking about forager technologies and innovations during the social upheaval in the middle in Popo Valley. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I think this is a, a pretty significant change of pace <laughs> compared to the other talks. Um, the next two talks will both be from archaeologists. Um, for anyone who's, I'm sure you're all familiar with archaeology, but if you aren't, you could watch Indiana Jones. You won't learn anything about archaeology. And if you want to learn about the secrets that we're keeping from the rest of the world, you can watch Graham Hancock's series on Netflix. Um, yeah. All right, so I'm going to talk about hunter-gatherers in northern South Africa in the Mapungubwe National Park. Um, I'm going to speak briefly about who these people are, um, why are we doing our research in the middle of Mpopo Valley specifically, why in Mapungubwe, uh, and then I'm going to look briefly at these innovations and technologies that uh, is alluded to in my, in my title before finishing off just by mentioning a few of the sort of bigger issues surrounding some of the research that we're doing in this part of the world. Hunter-gatherers in southern Africa go by many names. Uh, we often call them hunter-gatherers or foragers um, when we're talking about archaeological versions of these, of these communities. But presently, they still exist here in southern, southern Africa. They, are, they go by two common names. The one name is San, which is a name that the Khoisan Council in South Africa have elected as a term that they choose to be recognized by. Another term that is often used is Bushman. That's a ter another term that has been elected as a term to be recognized by, by those groups living in the Kalahari region. So the way we use these two terms is without any pejorative connotations, it's out of respect to those communities. I particularly like this image. It's an image that featured in National Geographic some years ago of um, four individuals walking across the Makadikadi Pan region. And why I like it is that it kind of it kind of showcases the, the isolation that we tend to associate with hunter-gatherer communities. In particular, when it comes to a lot of archaeological studies around places like Mapungubwe and so on, we, don't, we, we see hunter-gatherer groups as kind of separate. They're apart from these other socioeconomic developments happening here in Southern Africa. And, and I think this image captures that nicely. There was a very intense debate in archaeology from more or less the 1980s called the Kalahari Debate which ultimately pitted two groups of people against each other, one group saying that hunter-gatherers is a kind of archetypal human being. So this is what we all were at some stage in our past. And the other group arguing that, in fact, there's intense interactions that have taken place between people, which includes hunter-gatherers meeting farmers and pastoralists, changing and shifting their economy as these interactions underwent. Why I like this image as well is, those darkened images in the background that you can kind of see, those silhouettes, are cattle. And cattle have no natural progenitors here. They were introduced into this part of the world. So in an image like this, it has this sort of veil to it. On the one hand, it introduces this kind of isolation. But when we look a bit closer, we realize, in fact, these communities have, were very connected to other people, other landscapes, economies, um, uh, different societies, politics. And that's the kind of work that we're looking at in northern South Africa. 
So the area that we're focusing on uh, is the, we call it the Middle Limpopo Valley. It's where Mapungubwe National Park is located. It includes Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, around the Shashi and Limpopo confluence region. This area, archaeology, you don't need to worry about all the other archaeological sites on this map, but this area is quite well known archaeologically, and some of you may have visited it. You may have been to Mapungubwe. The top right image is Mapungubwe Hill. It's a quite a stunning hill. You can see uh, it's a quite a flat-topped hill. At the bottom, there's a large boulder that's collapsed. On the left-hand side, there's an artist's rendering of what Mapungubwe would have been like. Uh, and on the bottom right are some golden items that they found at Mapungubwe. So this site is world-renowned. It's very well known. It's been studied since the 1930s. Uh, it was uh, re-found in the 1930s by the Global West. Um, the University of Pretoria was very involved. And, and from that research, what has come about uh, is a, a general acceptance that Mapungubwe was Southern Africa's earliest state-level society, so our first urban center here in Southern Africa. Um, so that's why it's a very significant site. It was established at about AD 1220, so just over uh, what, about 800 years ago. Uh, and as you can see in the drawing, on the top of the hill there was some settlement. This would have been the king or chief. Um, and, and various important people, such as wives. The gold comes from a burial on top of the hill, around the base of the hill where the big rock is. You can see it in the photograph as well. That's a court. Uh, that's where political proceedings would have been undertaken. And then, then around the hill are elite or royal groups, and further away, like at the bottom here, are your subsistence-based farmers. So this is the capital. It, it had about 5,000 people living around it and 10,000 in total. And a lot of our research in this area has focused on this. How did this happen? What has to happen for a state to form? Trade, economies, uh, exotic trade, craft specialization. We start to see hierarchies forming, more important people, less important people. And that's what we see in the site. And a lot of that research has looked at that. But what the research hasn't considered, by and large, is how hunter-gatherers who were on this landscape before farmer communities arrived, how they interacted and networked into these systems. And so that's the work that I'm going to talk briefly about now. This is just a close-up of our area. The, you can see MPG on the far right. That's Mapungubwe. That's the images I just showed you. The site we're working on is LMS, uh, in the, more or less the middle. But there's a lot of hunter-gatherer sites that we've now were excavated. So some of the findings I talk about come from other sites as well. But we have a pretty good spread of sites now, actually. It's, it's quite nice what we've done, actually. I like it. All right, so this is, um, this is a little muck. This is just a little flyby. Um, the, it's a shelter north-facing at the edge of the Limpopo River floodplain. It's set into this, uh, this copy ridge you can see over here, sandstone ridge. It backs onto the Kalopi River uh, uh, on the other side. Um, here you can see some, some of us excavating at the site, pretending that we're busy. Um, the, here's this sort of another flyby. So it's, it's, the shelter's quite large. It's quite a big opening. Uh, there's a fair amount of space inside the shelter, but there's a lot of space outside, which you'll, you'll, you'll see just now. So here's another flyby. Um, they were telling rude jokes at that point. They were very worried about the sound. Um, but anyway, so you can see what the site kind of looks like. On that wall there where everyone's excavating, on, there's a lot of rock art. It's a bit faded, unfortunately, but there's a lot of rock art there. And so it's quite an interesting site. You have this internal component, you have an external, external component. Uh, you also have um, the smaller shelter on the, uh, next to it, which we, we excavated and found nothing. Great. Um, the, so it was, the site was excavated. I'm going to just uh, stop the video now. The site was excavated in uh, the late 1990s. There are two squares uh, that were excavated. You can't really see them. It's this one, th these two here, and then there were four squares out in the open. So just to give you a sense, that dashed line there, that's inside the shelter, that's outside over there. And they found some really cool things. They found evidence of intense craft production. So people living here were producing goods at a very intense level. At a, at a rate f that far exceeded their requirements. Uh, and this intensified as farmer communities moved into the area. So the earlier farmer groups, when they arrived, the uh, uh, foragers living in the shelter produced a massive amount of craft goods. And now being people, archaeologists interested in economies and how hunter-gatherers fitted in, we chose to re-excavate the site. So you can see the darker squares, how we dig is in one by one meter squares generally, then we divide that up into quadrants. So we've dug quite a lot of the site. It's very slow going. It's not like you know, 
planting a tree in your garden where you just dup, 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 and you put it in the ground. We dig in three centimeters at a time, we level everything off, and then we move on to the next three centimeters, and we follow natural soil horizons. Uh, so this is a, what we call a profile. If you imagine a square dug into the ground, and then you look at the wall of your square, this is what you'll see. So these are the various different soil horizons that we pick up on. So for example, this GB2 here dates to the Mapungubwe period. So that's about 800 years old, more or less. Um, GB3 dates to about 1000 to 1220 AD, roughly. So we're looking at about 1000 years. And this PBG1 and PBG1 plus layer um, is a little bit older than that, probably about 900 AD. And so this is how we go about things. Uh, what we found at the site was a nice and interesting spread of artifacts, uh, a lot of really interesting ones I'm going to show you in a moment, but just to quickly go through some of the patterns we picked up. This is density analysis we've run, so we've looked at how dense the artifacts are accumulating in different portions of the, of the site. So what you can see in the early, in the lower section here, for example, there's a high amount of production of stone tools. This predates the arrival of farmers. So foragers were living here, producing a lot of goods, and we're talking in the thousands here. Um, at that time, it, it then begins to decline, and in this level over here, this is when farmers firmly establish themselves in the valley, and they begin to uh, trade, and so on and so forth. We see a little peak, and we see that in, in the various different lines of evidence. All of a sudden, there's a, an increase in activities at our site, um, and this is quite cool, and then, it, and then after that, it kind of drops and eventually disappears. All right, so just to show you what I'm talking about, these are, these are very cool in case you can't see. They're very cool. Uh, you know, archaeologists, they're, they're small. They're the size of your fingernails. Archaeologists often get excited by small tools, uh, stone tools. Um, so these are very small, possibly arrowheads. Thank you. Um, they are, if they are arrowheads, and we suspect some of them are, um, they are way out of their distribution range. You find these in the Orange River Basin, largely in Lesotho, and we have about 10 of them up there, which is very unusual. Very interesting. Uh, I've, I've subjected these to a use wear analysis, so we put them under a microscope. We look for uh, deterioration patterns along the edges, breakages for, for, uh, related to hunting and so on. Uh, and the results were staggering. I found nothing. So if they are arrowheads, they weren't used or they weren't used intensively enough to result in, in damage or wear on the edges. But we, the craft evidence I was talking about is why we dug this site. Sorry, those stone, stone tools date about two, just over 2,000 years ago. Um, the craft evidence is really cool. These are scrapers on the right-hand side used to scrape wood, animal fat, a variety of different things. These, this is what is just on another level at Little Muck. There are so many of these things. So what we did is we, well, my postdoc, there's a poster about this outside uh, with my postdoc. We re she replicated these stone tools and then went and used them on bone, shell, wet hide, dry hide, uh, plants, um, ostrich eggshell, and ochre, and then we analyzed the deterioration patterns on those, and then we looked at our archaeological samples to look for consistency, and we find a really interesting shift that took place the moment farmers arrived in this region. So changes in hunter-gatherer society appear to be very much linked to what's going on with farmers as well. Uh, and the last slide was some pretty tools. These are, st these are drawings of tools, uh, stone tools. Um, they, what's interesting about this is that I we quite particularly interested in what foragers were doing at the time of Mapungubwe. How were they participating? How were they contributing to these big socio-political networks? And so it's obviously important for us to be able to say they were here, because if they weren't there, well, you know, then we can't really have that discussion. And so these are very diagnostic. The only people producing these tools are hunter-gatherers, and we're finding them in in our, in our excavations in those Mapungubwe levels, which confirms that they were around during this period in time. They were there on the landscape. We know they were there. So of course, you know, the next question is, what exactly were they doing at that time as well? And that's something that we, we are still answering. All right, so just to, to wrap up very briefly, we're looking at a range of different things, how they participated in, in trade networks. This is international trade coming into South Africa. We're looking at craft production. This particular site looks like it may have been a trade center where craft specialization took place, uh, and we're very interested in, in trade wealth. We also look at a number of sites, so we're looking how people ranked these sites, which were more important, which were less important. And this is an important development historically for humans, because when you have ranked spaces, that's when you start to look at the development of states and, you look, uh, and different societies. And we're looking at uh, a number of other things, which I won't go into for, 
for trade purposes. I mean, trade. <laughs> for time purposes. All right, so uh, our work continues at Little Muck. Oh, no, sorry, not at Little Muck. Our work has ended here. Just some images um, just to show you how much fun we have. Um, there's us excavating at Little Muck, both inside and outside the shelter. Um, here you can see what one of our open trenches looks like. So you can kind of see the different soil horizons. A lot rockier down there than it is up here, for example. This is backfill, so after we excavate, we rehabilitate our sites. So this is from a previous excavation of ours. Um, and then uh, there's some more excavations. And you can just see the finds, beautiful stone tools, pottery. This is a piece of worked bone, so it's filed down, rounded, polished to be used as a needle, as a link shaft, as an arrowhead. And also, we put those under the microscopes and, uh, and, and uh, try to figure out what they were used for. And then here's someone just recording the rock art in the site. We are shifting into other sites nearby um, to, to look at these interactions. One of the things we've also found is hunter-gatherers weren't only living in hunter-gatherer sites. They started to lift, lift, uh, move into farmer settlements as well. And this is very unusual because if you look at a lot of the research people have done, they haven't been finding this. And I know exactly why, because I've been on these e excavations where, you know, when you're focusing on Iron Age farmer archaeology, if you find Stone Age stuff, you kind of ignore it because it's not your field. And so it's created this bias. So, so yeah, there'll be more coming, hopefully. Um, but thank you very much. I appreciate it for your attention. I hope it made sense. It's, I know it's a bit different to everything else. But uh, thank you very much. Cool, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, there's no time for questions, but thanks for reminding me why I enjoy this session so much. <laughs> it was an excellent talk. Um, so next up, we have a five-minute speed talk by Justin van Yerden. Justine. Sorry, did I say Justin? I mean Justine. Sorry. Um, assessing the effectiveness and impact of an interactive traveling museum. That sounds interesting. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Justine van Yerden and I am a master's student in archaeology at the University of Pretoria. I am also one of the archaeologists, a part of the Hunter Gather Archaeological Research Project, the project that Dr. Forsman started, and also one of the people in the video pretending to do something. Um, <laughs> so today we'll be looking at the first year of my master's research, um, assessing the effectiveness and impact of an interactive traveling museum, closing the distance between people and heritage. Okay, so. You basically just heard what HARP is about. We study hunter-gatherers in the Mapungubwe National Park, um, and hunter-gatherer sequences in this area is still very poorly understood because they contributed immensely to the rise of the Mapungubwe Kingdom. And one of the goals of HARP is to better understand this contribution. And um, we also have a goal in HOP that we want to share this information with the public, share our research through our community outreach program. And one of our outreach um, initiatives is the HOP Traveling Museum. But specifically, my research aims to determine if a traveling museum display is truly effective at improving access to heritage and informing and educating the public. So just a bit of, back, a bit of background. Um, the concept of a traveling museum is not entirely new. It became quite popular during the middle of the 20th century. Um, and a noteworthy example in a Southern African context is the Namibian Mobile Museum Service that began in 1996. And it was based on a similar service in Botswana at the time. Um, the interactive aspect of museum displays also became quite popular during the same time period. Um, and they, that developed during the new museology or new museum theory turn, when museums began to make um, displays that were interactive. And this was an attempt to make or to be more inclusive. So here we have a quick overview of what the museum looks like. The museum consists of a wooden frame and then these five displays. Um, you don't really get a sense of the museum just looking at the pictures, so you get a real sense of and the experience of the museum when you come, um, if you come to have a look at it. Look at it. So um, wink, wink, hint, hint, it is outside. Um, so 
Each display discusses a different topic. So first we have the earlier and the Middle Stone Age, then the later Stone Age, some South African rock art, the Iron Age, and experimental archaeology. Now the displays are also um, arranged following the stratigraphic process to visit, visually illustrate um, how an archaeological site might be excavated, as well as the law of superposition. Um, so we gave questionnaires to people who have already viewed the traveling museum, and we got overwhelmingly positive results. People absolutely loved it. They quoted the museum as being informative, good for rural areas, and pushing beyond the normal museum experience. They also agreed that the museum made it easier for them to access heritage, and that the interactive aspects of the displays made it also easier for them to better understand the archaeology and what we were talking about in each display. Um, so those three first points, those are expectations that we had when we started the um, research beginning last year. So as you can see from our findings, we were quite spot on. And then we have one last expectation, and that is that the traveling museum will be used as a template by traditional museums and maybe even fellow researchers to create similar displays. And um, this is because these displays are extremely easy to produce. They can discuss absolutely any topic and they can also easily be changed. Um, so that is why you are all invited and very welcome to come and have a look at the Travelling Museum. We set it up this morning in the poster room, so it, I will be available there during tea time as well as during the poster session tomorrow. So, so please come and have a chat, have a look. We will discuss the museum in more detail, go through each drawer if that is what you would like. We brought it all the way from Mbombela. Um, I recently actually moved to Mbombela, so if we're being technical, it actually came all the way from Mokopane, and that's five hours away. So please come and have a look, please come chat with us, and any comments and feedback would be greatly appreciated. So thank you. Thank you so much, Justine. Um, there's no more time for questions, but I'm sure you'll have many questions when actually looking at the display. Oh, I was going to say no touching the display, but apparently you can. It is encouraged. Okay. It's encouraged. Yeah. Please come yeah. and touch. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so that wraps up our cultural heritage and archaeology session. So we'll be starting um, the fire ecology and management session now with just two talks uh, before tea time. And we'll be starting with Abram Dabengwa. We'll be talking about um, a multi-dimensional approach to reconstructing savannah fire disturbance regimes in the Satara area of Kruger. Thanks, Abram. Oh, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to take you back to a bit of archaeology. So the session of archaeology is still, still running. So I'm just going to briefly talk about some work that um, we're doing in the Satara region, where we're using um, paleoecological tools, uh, methods to, you know, that we use in reconstructing past fires, how we can actually use those methods um, in modern um, landscapes. So. I want to start with this uh, image. So, so this is one of the interesting um, images when you see landscapes. Like at the moment, like we've been talking about grass ecosystems, and one way that these uh, ecosystems are classified are in terms of growth forms. So you get these open ecosystems, the ones I've highlighted in in red, where you see that there's they're mostly dominated by grasses with trees, um, where the you know, trees could be more abundant or they could be less abundant, but these systems generally have, you know, some of them do have a lot of herbivores. They are different from forested ecosystems where there's closed canopy cover. Um, in these ecosystems, uh, because the session is on fire, fire happens, and fire is a key driver of many ecosystem processes. And when fire happens, 
um, charcoal is produced. So this is where I come in. And one thing about charcoal is that it can stay for a long time. And charcoal has been very useful in giving us a lot of information about vegetation dynamics and, you know, um, which is one of the things that uh, park managers would like to know is like, how can fire be used to manage the ecosystems, you know, biodiversity, you know, all these different components. So, this charcoal is a product of incomplete combustion of um, organic biomass. So, in this case, like, I, if it's the biomass is a tree or a, I means it's a plant, then you can actually get a bit of structure from from um, from the charcoal fragments. And charcoal, unlike other organic uh, material that gets uh, deposited in sedimentary environments, it doesn't decay, so it stays, it can preserve for a long time, like millions and millions of years. And you can use this, uh, you can identify charcoal um, from, you can identify species from their charcoal because charcoal preserves the structure, the morphology, the internal tissues of, of plants. And if you have a nice sequence, you can actually start reconstructing how, you know, key components of vegetation um, have changed over varying time. But for this talk, I am just going to focus on charcoal abundance, which is like the amount of charcoal. So the idea is if a system experiences a lot of fire, it's likely to uh, retain a lot of charcoal. So it's a very simple idea. Um, so our charcoal. So Kruger Park is a very beautiful place to work as a paleoecologist because there's a lot of studies that have been done here. As you can see with these red dots in the north, we've got studies that they looked at uh, you know, fire history is ranging from 300 all the way to like 10,000 years. We've got these sites in the north. And then in the south, we've got, we've got these uh, modern studies where they use uh, wetlands, pens, and stuff to actually see if you can um, reconstruct fire history, the recent fire history in the last five years. So these are modern studies, and these are, um, uh, for, these are like... Uh, yeah, we'll call them ancient or, you know, archaeological, paleoecological studies. So they cover a very long time scales. And a lot of questions have been answered or have been discussed using uh, paleoecology in terms of using uh, based on charcoal. So one of the things that, you know, um, has happened, I think uh, my uh, previous supervisor, Lindsay Gilson, has been, you know, with the management of Kruger discussing uh, stuff from ecological theory, uh, management, and many aspects of, um, you know, policy. And the question was, how can we use long-term data to actually meet these? And charcoal was one of the proxies that have been used. So one of the questions, I mean, the key find the key um, take-home messages from these studies, the ones in the north and the south, is that we know information about, you know, how fire drives pitch dynamics in terms of the transitions of vegetation. We know about how fire controls heterogeneity. And certain um, ideas have been developed in terms of adaptive management based on what has been found out about the fire histories from charcoal. And some ideas that have come out is this ideas of um, resilience, ecological threshold, but also how the park's own system of actually monitoring biodiversity, in this case, like the thresholds of potential concern, um, they actually have been tackled in terms of using charcoal and other proxies. Okay. So, um, things are, these are the key studies that, you know, from the north, and, you know, in terms of, you know, there is a definite, like, uh, relationship between charcoal amount and charcoal fire activity. But this is what they found that was actually quite interesting, that um, as tree cover increases, like, fire activity increases. So this 
is an unexpected finding, but I think it just might be an aberration of how the proxies are interpreted. So in terms of the studies from the modern studies, they were able to show or argue that, you know, um, charcoal particle size has got a relationship with dispersal distances. So the idea is that, like, when a fire occurs locally, um, when a fire occurs, uh, bigger particles of charcoal are retained locally, whereas the smaller particles are spread over um, a, much, a much wider distance. And this is one of the theories that we use in charcoal analysis, where we, we've got a, a certain threshold or cutoff in terms of particle size, where one part tells you, it's supposed to tell you about local fire history and the other about regional fire, because the particles could be dispersed from anything from five to 100 kilometers. But there's been a lot of changes. Um, I mean, this theory has been developing, and now we are kind of like in this era where we've agreed that open ecosystems are the way to go. And there's an interesting paper by William where we talk about, you know, the green, uh, brown, and black worlds, which we all are familiar with, which I will not go over. But the basic idea is that you've got traits, consumer-controlled traits, that like the plants in the landscapes have got either traits that are adapted to, or responsive to herbivores in the brown world, fire survival in the you know, black world, and resource traits in the green world where you actually find your, your forests. But we are just dealing with that. And he's got a nice book that came out. And also from like from a grass, from a herbaceous perspective, we've got this um, um, idea that you can actually um, dwell with the, with the black and, and brown worlds, in which case, you know, we're looking at the tall grass and short grasses and with forbs, like, hanging in between. And those similar traits that have been discussed here are expanded further. So when I combine all these ideas, I... I come up with this, where I, you know, if there's a tree biomass tree cover, and then what you have here at the top is like, you know, your closed state will be your forest, and then your open state, you'll see that you have two alternative ones. Um, one, where there's high grass field loads will there be a fire state, and the other one with lower grass field, field loads will be like a herbivore state. And from the previous um, slide, when I talked about how Sally and others have actually expanded in terms of like uh, tall grasses and short grasses, how as you move from the short grass to tall grass, you know, you've got this trade-off in terms of key traits of grasses where it's with one, as you move increasing fuel loads, you're getting um, more flammability because you, you've got more biomass, which is less palatable, which can only mostly be consumed by fire, whereas like, with shorter grasses at high herbivore biomass, the plants don't, um, the grasses like, um, are generally have got, are more palatable because they are, they are less lignin. So, but let's go back to um, the theory of charcoal and its use in reconstructing fire. So what you'll see is um, that when you split, when you've got, we talked about that split between the local and the landscape fire based on charcoal size. But is it really valid, you know? So what you'll see here is um, that there's a very close relationship between um, adjacent um, particle sizes, and there's very high correlation. So which means that, you know, it's, it's two sides of the same coin, basically. You're looking at the one signal, and it's not two signals at all. At the same time, there's an appreciation that, you know, charcoal frequencies are not so good. What actually matters is the charcoal size, particularly the elongation ratios, because they can tell you about whether your charcoal source is woody or it's more grassy, with grasses having much longer and short, they are, much, they are much longer because they are, they are long and thin, so whereas like um, woody charcoal is usually more compact, so it's, it's got a different shape factor. 
but also at the same time, like for my thesis, for my PhD thesis, I, I try to think about how this problem could be solved. You know, if you can't use frequencies and you're going to use size, um, what is the best way of looking at, of reconstructing the system? So in the end of the day, I was able to say, okay, fine, what you do have, you should ideally, if you want to look at the dynamics, have a system where the variable, like from where charcoal is giving you an, an idea of a state variable over time, and if frequency is not doing it, um, size is one of the things that um, I decided to focus on by looking at different size classes. And so one of the things I looked at was flammability. And um, so what I was able to see is that there's a very close relationship between size between size and um, between charcoal frequency and charcoal size. And one of the things is that, uh, so this relationship um, can be able to separate like two different states, a low fire state and a higher fire state. And so I was able to take this, the question is now, with, but this method has not been tested explicitly. So what happened now is like we went, uh, to do this, uh, to see how, if, you know, if those states can be found. So we looked at this size in, in um, Satara where there's, uh, there's long-term fire experiments, and then we've got these long-term fire experiments for 70 years, and then there was a no burn plot, and then we've got uh, short-term fire, annual fire and grazing, um, and then we've got the with the control. So what we were able to find was that there's a big difference between annually bent and not bent plot. And as expected, the distribution of particles follows what we expect, which is unsurprising. And what you find here is that the different um, treatments have got distinctive um, particle size, which means that there's a way that actually might, this might actually be driven by, by the underlying uh, fuel, which is the vegetation. So what you see here is that like, when you see the abundance, so abundance and, um, and, uh, and, and the size fractions of the charcoal are linked. There's more, there's fewer large particles, there's many small particles, but Abundance in area are different. And then here now, you can just see that you can, your, the annually bent and the not bent plots are very distinctive. So those are distinctive like alternate states and we can see it here. Whereas like when you include the, the pitch where there's fire and grazing, it cuts across the whole spectrum. So it's really difficult. It's not very distinctive um, signal. So the next step is to combine other proxies in terms of phytolists where we can say something about grasses. And then we're going to use dung fungal spores and they'll tell us something about herbivory and grazing intensity. And at the same time, we have more, we're actually looking at um, macro charcoal at finer scale using shape factors. So we've got the results, but yeah, pending analysis because it's a bit of a, messy data set. Yeah, and we've got all these. Um, so lastly, we are going to try and see whether the parameters or the, the um, what do you call it? The, um, so the constants that I, I, was, I, was, I was explaining that, you know, we know the relationships, but are the constants similar for, similar for the same systems or are they similar in different systems or do they change? So that's one of the things that we still have to find out because then we can actually be sure that um, charcoal size is a very useful um, metric to measure in, in reconstructing uh, elements of fire history. And yeah, I just want to thank, yeah, just want to thank you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Abram. We don't have any time for questions, so we'll be moving on to Louis Hanik.
um, who will be talking about the importance of fire in shaping uh, plant species distribution and that it depends on fire and plant life history traits. Thanks, Louis. Oh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there for the last talk before the break. Um, first of all, I want to um, thank and um, like name Stuart Smith because he really spearheaded this project and um, contacted a bunch of people who contributed data to um, our data set. And of course, I want to thank all the data contributors um, without whom this project would obviously not be possible. So um, we've heard a lot about fires, and you guys probably know much more about fire than I do, but um, we know that fires are super important in um, savannas. They can shape plant species communities and affect species richness and um, affect ecosystem service or like uh, processes in many different ways. However, um, fire is not a um, uniform disturbance. Um, it's actually quite patchy and quite diverse. And um, these, or that fire diversity or pyro diversity is often characterized by different um, attributes, such as um, how often an area burns fire frequency or how intense it burns. And um, plants have adapted all kinds of traits and mechanisms to deal with um, this kind of um, disturbance and this uh, diverse disturbance. Now, this is going to be a talk about modeling. I'm sorry. Um, um, Species distribution modeling can be used for many things, including looking at uh, species richness and uh, looking at some community um, structures. And I will be using this uh, species or like a species distribution model. Um, traditionally, though, species distribution models uh, ignore the disturbance proxies and they only include or, or look at like environmental variables like precipitation or um, topographical variables. And although I'll include those in my model as well, I will be um, looking at um, disturbance variables specifically. So our first question would be um, to figure out how important these disturbance variables actually are in determining species distributions. And then secondly, when we look at specifically fire, um, can we see a different effect of different fire attributes in determining species distributions? So my system is uh, the Serengeti ecosystem, which is um, a famous biodiversity hotspot in northern Tanzania. It is dominated by savanna uh, habitat, and up to 80% of uh, the Serengeti National Park is burned every year, although this is highly variable. Um, for those of you who are not super familiar with the um, area, we have a um, central national park that is surrounded by six uh, buffer zones-ish, um, and the main human activities in those buffer zones and the park are, um, well, obviously there's no livestock herding and agriculture in the national park, but in some of the buffer zones there are, and then there's of course also tourism. Um, since it's a modeling talk, I will have to talk about the data that goes into it. So um, our plant species data set, as I mentioned, is a huge collaborative effort. We have so far 22 projects um, that have data from 2001 until 2020. Um, in our data set, we recognize more than uh, 400 species um, across more than 1,700 unique locations that you can see there. Um, but in this talk or in this analysis, I will only focus on 108 species that were um, arbitrarily selected um, because we wanted to have the species that are present in at least 1% of the sites, so about 17 sites. And this is to uh, prevent rare species to influence our model too much. Um, yeah, so we considered four fire attributes, fire frequency, timing, size, and intensity. And on the right side here, you can see what fire uh, frequency looks like. Um, so we, it's a very simple measure of fire frequency. It's basically um, scaled uh, from zero to one, with one being basically a fire every year over the last 22 years, um, and zero being no fire recorded in um, the last 22 years. Now, you can't see it on this map here because of the lights, but here, this is basically zero. There is no fire here, and this is mainly due to um, livestock herding and some agriculture activities in Lolliondo, this area here. Um, and then also interesting, but you can't see that here, just outside of this park, there's been no fire for 22 years, and there's this huge difference between um, very high frequency inside the park and just outside, um, there is no um, fire recorded in 22 years. So I say 22 years because that's where the, um, the MODIS data that we use um, has data from. Before that, there was no data available. Okay, 
the second human disturbance that I should have mentioned already that we looked at was human disturbance, and so we considered two main factors, livestock density and a uh, road network. And so, um, as I mentioned already, livestock is mostly common in these um, buffer zones on the right side and somewhat on the right side here. But uh, these effects of um, livestock do um, go into the national park uh, through a process that was coined um, like the Serengeti squeeze, basically stating that uh, some of the um, human activities and pressures outside of a national park can uh, have um, or can affect ecosystem functioning within the core of the national park. Um, and we also included a road network or a distance to road um, um, because of invasive species that are often uh, transported into uh, areas through roads. Yes. Okay, so the model we used is a joint species distribution model, uh, which is basically a simple species distribution model, um, but for many different species, in my case 108, and instead of just stacking them on top of each other, we um, allow species to interact with each other because species don't live in isolation. The um, presence of one species is likely to influence the um, likelihood of presence of another species in the same area. Um, and so, yeah, the joint species distribution models, they try to like bridge um, the fields of community ecology with species distributions, but obviously um, lean a bit more towards species distributions. So the specific framework we use is HMSC, it's called HMSC, or Hierarchical Modeling of Species Communities. Um, it's a multivariate um, regression model in, uh, with Bayesian inference, and the cool thing about it is that not only does it allow you to um, assess their link to environmental covariates, like rainfall and disturbances and all that, and um, allows uh, species interactions, but it also allows you to correct for or look into species phylogeny and um, to um, include plant traits. However, we don't yet have data on plant traits, so we won't be including that in this model. So these results are somewhat preliminary, and I pre um, focus on this one graph because it's um, relatively similar to um, frequency statistics. We basically look at um, beta coefficients, which is the same you would have from regression models. And in this figure, one dot represents one species model, and then dot is only included if it falls within the credible interval or it's a, an important covariate for that species. And so on the right-hand side here, you can see the number of species this one covariate was um, important for. So for fire attributes, what we can see is that um, there's varying effects. Some species are positively affected, um, and some species are negatively affected by fire, which is entirely what we expect. Um, and some effects seem to um, be somewhat exclusive. So all of these species that were affected by fire frequency um, do not have any other fire attributes that are important in their model. Now, obviously, these uh, results are somewhat preliminary, and these were run um, relatively quickly, these models. I don't know if you know Bayesian statistics, they can, or like some of these models can run very long, and, and these were not run that long. So this can change a little bit, but um, yeah, these are our preliminary results. We also find that um, for several species, it's more complex. So um, there's um, multiple attributes that are important um, for them with sometimes um, um, different, like, um, Effects like some are positively affected by fire timing, while others are, uh, and and are negatively affected by fire size. For um, human disturbances, the most important variable was livestock density, with most species being negatively affected um, by livestock density, but some um, seem to benefit from livestock density. And similarly, um, for the sort of standard variables that we included. Um, precipitation was most important, uh, with most species benefiting from pre um, higher precipitation, with some species doing better in areas with less precipitation. Okay. So um, I wanted to take out four species um, here because um, the model pops these out as uh, quite interesting. Um, so Biden's below some Biden's Schimperi, um, and then Amaranthus Hybridus and Acheronthus Aspera. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, so these four species seem to really like disturbance. So all of those species were um, negatively affected by precipitation, positively affected by fire, and positively affected by human disturbances. And this 
also brings forth an, uh, another thing that comes from the model, which is that there was a strong phylogenetic effect, which basically means that um, more related species showed a, a more similar response to environmental covariates or disturbance covariates than unrelated species. And so obviously these two groups are, are like these two species each are very uh, strongly correlated or related to each other, and they also show very similar responses. Um, so in conclusion, are disturbances important for um, species distribution models? Uh, yes, we find that both fire intensity and livestock density were a very strong predictor, the second and third strongest predictor in our model. Um, and then fire attributes can be or can yield interesting results or differentiating between them because they can have a differential effect. And we think that this is partly because um, species might have developed traits that are specific to a certain or to a predominant um, fire attribute, for example, um, fire intensity, um, yeah, fire intensity or fire frequency. Some species doing better when, um, or are most affected by uh, how frequent the fire is, while other species are most affected when, um, oh, how intense the fire is. Um, yeah. So next steps. We obviously want to include traits, and that's what I'll be doing um, after this conference. I'll be going into the field collecting traits. Um, mostly fire-related traits, because we see that um, fire does have an important effect on these species, and we see that there's a strong phylogenetic effect. Um, and we know that traits and um, uh, plant traits are like strongly um, wait, plant traits are strongly related to fire. Yes. Um, secondly, we would want to include wildlife herbivory because we don't really have any measure of um, herbivory in the model, um, and we know that this is a very important uh, variable for um, for plants as well. So, um, yeah. And then lastly, we would like to um, look at future change because we know that globally burned areas are declining, and together with climate change, this could mean that the distribution of these of many of the species might drastically change over time, or might even be extirpated um, from from the area. So, yeah. And lastly, before I say thank you, um, obviously I would very much welcome any comments on the model or any ideas you have. But of course. If you would have any uh, data that you would like to contribute, we would um, be most happy to uh, collaborate. Um, yeah, and thanks again to all the data contributors um, for their data and their insight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Louis. We do have a few minutes for any questions, if there are any. Tony. So there's quite a strong covariance of fire and precipitation. And I'm just wondering how the model actually deals with that. I mean, how, how do you separate the effects of the two? I didn't quite understand. I... So, so your, your fire variables and precipitation co-vary spatially quite mm -hmm. a lot. So how, do, how does the model handle that? Yeah, so none of the covariates were strongly correlated in amongst themselves, although we should expect that there is um, that there's some, um, some relation between those two. Um, we haven't um, delved into um, how they could particularly correlate with it, or like, yeah, we haven't really delved into how, what that could mean for the model, but um, the variables themselves were not correlated uh, how we include them. Okay, thanks so much, Louis. Okay, guys, so that's the end of the morning sessions. Um, can we give everyone a round of applause? Thank you. Okay, so we'll be back at 11 o'clock for the next session of the tea. Thank you.
Okay. okay. to do that during my session. Yeah. Just forewarn everyone that the electricity might go off during dinner or the next person's talk. Okay, so during no one's the like first or second talk, the, yeah. the load shedding will take place. Load yeah, there'll be a trans a There will be a transition yeah. between, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hate speaking in front, <laughs> Uh, welcome back everyone to uh, the next session. Uh, just a note, there will be a transition uh, with the load shedding, so during the first talk or the second talk, the electricity will go off just for a few minutes. Okay. So our first speaker is Xenia Singh, and she'll be telling us about early versus late dry season fire regimes.
Hi, everyone. I'll be talking about early versus late dry season fires and their consequence on the grass structure. Fires are an important modifier of grass structure and function as they improve the forage quality and at the same time alter the spatiotemporal patterns of grazing. The post-burned regrowth created in the landscape after fires creates a magnet effect in the, in the landscape where grazers preferentially choose the burnt patches as the foraging sites. The short-term concentration of grazers impedes the spread of future fires, suppresses the grazing intolerant grasses, and as well as concentrates the nutrients, thereby leading to the formation of stable grazing lawns, or we can also call them as the vast expenses of the short grass structure. We have a pretty good insight about how the grazers are attracted to the post-burn regrowth and the establishment of the grazing lawns following the fires. But what we are missing is the fact, what are the longer-term consequences of the fires on the grass structure? What extent of the short grass structures are created by different fires? And do these grazing lawns or these short grass structure persist if we exclude the fire out of the system? So one of the key component or the factor that really um, triggers the vegetation dynamics and the fire relationship is the fire season. As fires during different seasons can have variable consequence on the vegetation structure, with fires during dry season being more, more harder than as compared to the wet season fires. And within the early and late dry season fires, the early dry season fires tend to be more patchy than as compared to the late dry season fires. The effect of early and late dry season fires are well documented on the woody vegetation structure with late dry season fires causing more reduction in the above ground biomass than as compared to the early dry season fires. Similar is with the vegetation volume loss across different canopy height. So here the green line denotes the plot uh, which never burns. And these different color lines are fires at different frequencies. And we clearly see that how the vegetation volume loss is much more higher in the late dry season fires than as compared to the early dry season fires. But what are the responses of the grass structure to these early and late dry season fires? That is still not clear. And in order to understand the effect of the late and early dry season fires on the grass structure, we are utilizing the Satara burn experiment, which is situated in the basalt geology of, of Kruger National Park. And this fire experiment was initiated in, in 2013 with early and late dry control burns applied at three different spatial scales, quarter hectare, five hectare, and 25 hectares. But for the 25 hectare ones, there was only like one fire treatment that was applied, and that was the late dry season. So we have early and late dry season combination only for the quarter hectare and the five hectare plots. We selected a control, or we could call it like the unburned part of the landscape, and we placed these plots just adjacent to the treatment plots, consisting of the same size as that of the treatment. So the fires were initiated in 2013, and then applied annually every year in, in the early dry season and late dry season. The early dry season fires were in April, May, and late dry season fires were in October. So the fires were applied in 2013, 14, 15. There were no fires in 2016 and 2017 due to drought. And then the last fire was applied in 2019. To study the uh, short grass structure across these different fire treatments, we quantified the structure using UAV LIDAR, or some people prefer to call it as the drone-based LIDAR. And the data acquisition was done in December 2020 which gave us like full one year of no fires or fire exclusion. And from the UAV LiDAR data, we created 
the short grass patches across different fire treatments, and as well as we created the grass volume at different vertical height intervals and the canopy cover. All the products that we created from the UAV LiDAR were mostly at a spatial resolution of 25 centimeters. Before moving on to any results, I'll show you some transects of how the grass structure looks like across the three different treatments. And we can clearly see here the abundance of tall grass in the unburned part or the unburned treatment than as compared to the early and late burn. But it's also really interesting here, like how heterogeneous the grass heights are in the early burn treatment and the late burn than as compared to the unburned where there's like so much homogeneous distribution of the tall grass. So the first thing that we quantified was the grass volume, which is represented here on the y-axis, and the x-axis represents the grass volume at, at different vertical bins. So fire significantly affected the grass volume, but only up till a height threshold of 10 centimeters. So up, till, up to a, a height interval of 10 centimeters, the grass volume was much more higher in the burn treatments than as compared to the unburned treatments. The highest or the largest difference between the unburned and the fire treatments volume was observed at a height threshold of one to five centimeters. And at a height threshold which was equal to 20 centimeter or like greater than 20 centimeter, the volume proportion was much higher in the unburned landscapes than as compared to, compared to the fire treatments. And there were not so much of significant difference between the early and late dry season volume comparison. They followed the same trend, like having higher volume up till 10 centimeters in both early and late dry season. Fires also significantly influence the extent of the short grass covers. Again, follow the same trend as the volume, with more short grass cover in the burn treatments till a height threshold of 10 centimeters than as compared to the unburned treatment. But one of the interesting thing here is that the early dry season fires were more influential in creating the shortest height grass, which is in the range of one to five centimeters, than as compared to the late dry season fires. The delineation of short grass patches revealed that the short grass patch area was consistently higher in the burn treatments, irrespective of the spatial scale. Also, one of the interesting thing here is that the irrespective of spatial scales, that the short grass patch area was always lower in the unburn treatments than as compared to the burnt treatment. So we have only like the comparison of like both early and late dry season fires present in the five hectares and a quarter hectare spatial scale. And we clearly see here that although the trend here is not so significant that, that the early dry season has a lot more short grass patch area, but it is not that significant. While at a five hectare spatial scale, we clearly see a significant difference between the early burn and the late burn, that the early burns have much more short grass patch area than as compared to the late burns. We were also interested in looking at the spatial variability of the grass heights across these different burn treatments. And on the y-axis here, you see the semi-variance, which is the a proxy for the spatial variability. We clearly see across the different spatial scales that there was higher spatial variability in the controls and the late months than as compared to the early dry season. The variance in the grass height was much smaller in the early burn treatments, which indicated that there was much more homogeneous distribution of the short grass patches in the early dry season than as compared to the late and controlled treatments. So in order to sum up all, all these results, Early dry season fires are much more influential in creating the short grass patch areas than as compared to the late dry season fires. And I would say that this could be like an efficient management strategy if the management is seeking to expand the grazing lawns 
because the late dry season fires have both practical and as well as the ecological constraints because it is hard to control the late dry season fires and some of the ecological constraints of the late dry season fires is the loss of large trees. Overall, we can say that these fire-induced grazing lawns, they persisted over longer term beyond fire exclusion. The one thing that we always talk about grazing lawns is how much vertical and horizontal heterogeneity do we have in the grazing lawns? So if we look at the average effect of both the early and late dry season fires, we see that both the fires created a grass cover in the range of 20 to 45 percent up till a height threshold of 20 centimeter. So we can clearly see that these fire-induced grazing lawns, they have the vertical and horizontal heterogeneity, which is required for the grazer coexistence and as well as for diversification. So going forward, so I just talked about late dry season fires and early dry season fires. What we are interested in looking at is how do different fire characteristics such as the residence time or rate of spread of fire, and as well as how fast does the temperature rise, does how do these characteristics vary across early and late dry season fires, and what are their implications on, on the grass structure? So, for this aspect, we are working on another small-scale fire experiment in Lower Sabi, situated again in the basalt geology, but with much more higher rainfall than as compared to the Satara landscape. And we, these, in the experiment, there were two fires, late and early dry season fires, and in both the seasons, the treatment size was one hectare, and almost like 20 plots, we have like a data of 20 plots from like both late and early dry season fires. And here's this like a short sneak peek from a RGB ortho mosaic, like how the early and late dry season fire plots look after being completely burned. And we can clearly see some distinct patterns between early and late dry season fires here. So we, for sure, we are using the uh, the 3D vegetation structure data before and after fire. But at the same time, in order to characterize the, the fire characteristics, we acquired thermal data during fire at every second in order to quantify the residence time, rate of spread of fire, intensity, and as well as how fast is the temperature changing across the early and late dry season fires. So here's a short video of one of the plot that was burned in the late dry season in the lower Sabi fire experiment. So we started off with some preliminary analysis, like how does the burn completeness vary between the early and late dry season fires? And we see like a huge variability across the burn completeness in the early dry season, while in the late dry season fires, the burn completeness is mostly around like 85 to 90%. So we can say here that the burn completeness was highly variable across the early dry season burns. The other thing that we looked at uh, across these early and late dry season fires was how different the residence time of fire was. So here the residence time of the fire is the time period during which the temperature was greater than 100 degrees Celsius. The residence time was much more higher in the late dry season fire than as compared to the early dry season fire. Then we started to look at how does the residence time correlate to the vegetation height change. There's almost like a linear relationship between the vegetation height change and the increase in the residence time for the late dry season fires. But for the early dry season fires, there is, again, like a huge variability. There's no clear relationship between increasing the residence time and the vegetation height change. We also looked at the rate of temperature change. The rate of temperature change, again, was higher for the late dry season burns than as compared to the early burns. And again, we compared to look at what is the correlation or a relationship between the, later, between the rate of temperature change 
and vegetation height change. Again, it follows the same trend that there is a linear, sort of linear relationship between the rate of temperature change and vegetation height change in the late dry season fires, but we still see a huge variability in the early dry season fires. So, uh, to, this is still like a, a brief glance of what we are aiming to do. And from all these results which I showed, we can clearly say that the higher variation in vegetation height change was observed during early dry season fires than as compared to the late dry season fires. But what we are expecting to do next is to concentrate more on the grass volume and grass biomass change with respect to more different fire characteristics and to move a little bit away from the vegetation height change and utilize the full LIDAR data to have more to see more of the effect on the grass volume and biomass. With that, I would like to conclude my talk, but at the same time, I'm really thankful to the Sandparks and all the other people, including Sally, Jason, Kate, Carla, Navashni, Tarshi, and many more, who are running these experiments and have been like a really good source of help in all sorts of, of analysis and everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, there's no time for, well, I guess we can take one, one question by the time we wait. Okay, thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Francis Brassard, and he will be telling us about the fire influences on ant diversity. Oh. Mm. All right. Hello everyone, thank you for being here. So today I'm gonna to be presenting results from the first uh, chapter of my PhD thesis. And so this work focuses on Australian tropical savannas. So savannas in Australia actually cover a really big range and so pretty much the upper third of the country and they host a really rich biodiversity. And just like other savannas, just like the African savannas in Australia, savannas burn frequently. So what this map shows is that anything that's in color was burned between 2000 and 2017. And the darker the color, the more frequent the fires. And where I live and do my research is right there around Darwin, just around that dark patch. So there's a lot of fires occurring over there. And so all these frequent fires make it important for us to understand what exactly are the effects of fire disturbances on fauna. And at this point, there's really no consensus on exactly how um, fire affects funnel diversity. Of course, though, there's been a lot of research on the subject, and generally, they'll um, separate the effects of fire in two different categories. So either you're gonna have the direct impacts of fire, so that's when a fire goes through a habitat, it actually directly kills the animals, or then there are the indirect impacts of fire, so that's when as the fire goes through the habitat, it burns the vegetation, and in doing so, it modifies the habitat itself. And perhaps surprisingly, what um, seems to be the most important in a lot of the literature is the indirect impacts of fire. Now, one of the issue, I think, is that most of the literature, most of the studies that I've been finding focuses on fire frequency treatments. And that can be a problem because it often ignores the effects of fire intensity as well as uh, the effects of fire on the vegetation itself. And so for instance, 
if you take just fire frequency and you take two patches that you burn at the same frequency. So we'll say we burn two patches every year. But depending on the vegetation on each of these patch or on some edaphic factors such as soil moisture, the patches may burn at very different intensities, which in turn will have different effects on the vegetation, which in turn means that the disturbance itself is not uh, exactly the same. Um, so low fires will, won't burn as much vegetation and won't be as much um, of a disturbance, and the contrast is going to be for a higher uh, fire intensity. So with my first chapter, I'm trying to entangle the different um, effects of fire frequency, intensity, as well as how uh, modifying vegetation structure affects fauna. And to do that, I'm really lucky because uh, right out of Darwin, there's this awesome territory uh, fire experiment, territory wildlife park fire experiment. So this has been ongoing for now 20 years. And uh, back in 2003, what they did is that they established 18 different plots. And in each of them, um, and these were separated in three different blocks. And in each block, there was several uh, fire frequency treatments, which would go from burning every year, every two years, three years, five years, or were left unburned for the whole time. And now that's been ongoing for 20 years. But what's also great about this experiment is that there's been scientists that have actually been recording the fire intensity values of each of those fires. So now we have an idea of what um, the amount of fire that a plot has accumulated. And there's also researchers that have been collecting LADAR data, which gives us um, an idea of the vegetation structure in each of these plots. So what I've been doing in the past two years is that I've been going inside each of these plots and I've been sampling fauna. And the fauna that I sample are ants. And so at this point, usually people wonder, well, why would you use ants? And I know that here uh, a lot would say, why don't you use the wonderful termites that are around over there? But I think there's a strong case to use ants. Um, so ants, I think, make for awesome model organisms, um, especially in terrestrial agricultural studies, because for one thing, they're ubiquitous. So unless you're studying the Arctic or the Antarctic, there's bound to be ants around you. If you're interested in response of um, uh, biodiversity to whatever factor, great, ants, there's a lot of species. Another thing is that they're abundant. So if you want to sample them, it's really easy. Um, try to find an ant. It's going to be, we can just go outside. We'll, we'll find plenty. And then, of course, they've got a really high global biomass, which just gives us a sense of how important it can be within ecosystems. And so also, interestingly, within ecosystems, ants do many different things. So they're consumers, uh, but they don't only, they're not only predators. They can also be scavengers, and they functionally can be herbivores in certain cases and also very important as prey for a range of animals. And one thing that I find quite interesting is that ants will enter a range of uh, relationships that go from mutualistic to parasitic to uh, with thousands of other species. And of course, ants compete especially with other ants. And so all this to say, ants are really cool, and uh, I think they make for great model organisms. So that's why I'm using ants. Um, for my chapter, and the main goal of this chapter will be, or is to look at um, the effects of fire, vegetation, fauna, and linking these together. And so, the data that I'm using for this, well, of course, I've got ants diversity data, which is collected in very simplistic uh, manners. We use pitfall traps, and then we just spend hours and hours at the lab identifying them. But this gives us um, abundance, richness, and composition for the ants, um, and in this case, uh, for each of the plot at the Territory Wildlife Park at the fire experiment. And to look at variation in each of these three metrics, what uh, I'm using are either the often, uh, often used fire frequency treatments, but I can also use now uh, fire intensity and canopy cover thanks to all the scientists that have been collecting this data. And so the first thing that I looked at was the uh, fire frequency treatments, and those were my first results. So here, We've got three different plots. On the upper left, we've got abundance, and we've got richness on the lower left, and then species composition on the right. And let's first start with abundance. Here uh, on the y-axis is basically the number of ants that are found in plots, and on the x-axis are the different fire treatments. And if you can't read the different fire treatments, it doesn't really matter because there's not much happening there. The only statistical difference in between any of the fire frequency treatments are between this one and this one. So the one is the burnt elite, um, burn late two years, every two years, uh, which had higher abundance than the unburned fire frequency treatment. But that's it. There's nothing else really uh, that this plot is telling us. 
And when it comes to richness on the lower left, it's actually worse. There's no statistical differences in richness across any of the fire treatments. And then lastly, when it comes to species composition, here this is nice and colorful, but what it, it should be showing if fire frequency treatments were a good predictor of ant species composition would be clusters of points um, of the same color. And that's because uh, this is an ordination, and each of the points is representing the species composition of a plot. So the closer the plots, uh, closer the points, the closer the species composition. But instead of seeing clusters of one color representing a fire treatment, what we see here is just a big colorful mess. All this to say that fire frequency treatments are not really good at predicting abundance, richness, or composition. So these were my first results, and I was like, oh, this is not super exciting. But uh, I thought that the story became a bit more interesting once I started looking at uh, fire activity or accumulated fire intensity. So again, we've got uh, abundance on the upper left, richness and species composition. But instead of violent plots here, because fire intensity is a continuous variable, I've got a cloud of points. And here, there's actually a relationship. And what's happening is that both abundance and richness initially increase with uh, fire intensity. So as you get more fire, you get more ants and more species of ants. And then it starts tapering off and going down, but only at the extreme values. As for species composition, there's not really any uh, sort of clustering happening there. But this is still interesting because fire intensity is predicting abundance and richness, so it's a better predictor. Uh, so I think that's more interesting than the fire frequency treatments. But by far, the most interesting results that I got was that um, when I looked at vegetation structure. So here, um, we've got canopy cover, uh, this time on the x-axis, but again, we've got plot abundance and then plot richness here. And uh, the relationship is uh, significant, but it is the reverse of as with fire intensity, which makes sense. And because as you move from open habitats into um, more closed habitats, you actually get less ants. So there's more species and more ants in the open habitats, and there's less as you get into the uh, forested habitats, which also don't accumulate as much fire intensity. As for species composition, here, if you can see it, there's actually a clustering of darker green points at the lower left here of the plot. And that's saying that uh, basically the species that are associated with the closed habitats are um, more similar to each other. So the species composition um, is more similar. All this to say, canopy cover is the best predictor of end diversity uh, in this study because it's predicting abundance, richness, and composition. But that made me think, uh, why is fire frequency treatment so bad at predicting end diversity? So the next thing that I looked is that um, I looked at the um, relationship between fire treatments and fire intensity. So here we've got box plots. And on the y-axis, uh, we've got fire intensity. On the x-axis, we've got the fire treatments. And what you can see, it does seem like there's some differences, but there's a lot of wooden treatment variation, especially if we look at this one here. That's a treatment that burns annually. And actually, in these plots, we get either really low-intensity fires, but we also get really high-intensity fires. So fire frequency is not relating that well with fire intensity. And the next thing that I did is I looked at that, but with canopy cover. And so it's the same thing happening here, is that there's a lot of within treatment variation uh, in canopy cover within a fire frequency treatment. And again, if we look at this treatment that burns every year, we get both low canopy cover and really high canopy cover. Now, in contrast, the relationship between canopy cover and fire intensity is actually quite good. And that makes a lot of sense, because as a plot is accumulating more fire, that means that more vegetation is getting burnt and the canopy is opening up more. Hence the great relationship. Now, to summarize my results, the goal of this was to link fire and vegetation and fauna. And I think that my results suggest that vegetation, vegetation structure uh, is a really uh, great predictor of faunal diversity. As for fire intensity, it's good at predicting uh, vegetation structure, and it does a fairly good job at predicting funnel diversity because there was a relationship uh, between ant abundance, richness, and fire intensity. However, fire frequency treatments in this instance by themselves were not very good at predicting fire intensity, vegetation structure, nor funnel diversity. And so what does this mean uh, for management? Well, in a way, it's good because 
as, at least uh, um, as far as ants are concerned, there's really no need to manage for precise fire treatments. Fire is generally a good thing because it seems to increase the abundance and richness of ants, um, but there's no need to manage patches uh, with early annual fires, every two years, every five years. Fire is just good. That being said, though, uh, we still need to uh, keep some patches of forest that stay unburned because, if you remember, these harbor a very different species composition of ants. So even though they're more depopulate, there's still some stuff that's not found in the open savannas. And so that was my first chapter. Um, I'm currently working on, on these other chapters. I'll be looking at the effects of disturbance on different ant communities because they're vertically stratified. And I'm interested in uh, looking into the effects of fire on functional diversity. And ultimately, I'd like to use resource selection algorithms to improve fire management. But it's still in the work, so stay tuned if you're interested in uh, more results on this. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one question. I don't know who's... Okay. Thanks. That was great. Um, uh, it seems to me that it, another possible implication or way to interpret this is that I know that there's a lot of talk in Australia about using, like, trying to shift intentionally to early season fires and whether early season fires sort of capture some of the effects of no fire, but also some of the effects of fires. But it seems like an implication of your work is that early season fires aren't doing the same job as late season fires that are intense, and that there really isn't any substitutability between those mild versus those intense fires. Is that a correct interpretation? Honestly, it could be, but I couldn't hear very well. I'm so sorry. Um, I think you, you try to contrast the early and the late fires and how uh, much their intensity, because their intensity are, are was low intensity good. fires and high intensity fires substitutable, or do you really need some high intensity fires in the system to right. actually create pyrodiversity in the landscape? Right. Well, so with these results, the only thing that I do have that would suggest that the high intensity fires are needed uh, would be that first plot showing that the late uh, fires, which are also the highest intensities at higher abundance. But apart from that, um, what these results seem to show that it's mostly that you need fire, but there's really no need to get the high intensity uh, versus the, or like a range of intensities. So it's not really supporting the pyrodiversity hypothesis in, in this instance, I would say. Thank you. Up next, we have Wayne and Muller, who's going to be telling us about how uh, increased fire frequency affects butterfly communities. All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, my name is indeed Vainant Miller, and I will be talking on how fire influences butterflies. I now realize that um, fire is a bit of a hot topic, so uh, bear with me. There are some things that are bound to be repeated, but I will try and limit that as uh, much as possible. Now, for this, we need some groundwork. So fire is quite important as an ecosystem modifier, along with herbivory. Um, it opens up a system. It um, increases germination rates and growth and all those things. So it is, is an important part of, of any system, and that's not different in, in the savanna context. So in our context, um, fires open up the system. It removes litter, it removes biomass, and this promotes um, the growth of uh, shade-sensitive um, forbs within that area. And, and this is something that we really need in terms of butterflies, that um, these serve as hosts for a lot of butterfly species, and this species richness and diversity increases the resilience and overall health of the system. So that's something that we kind of look at and something that we, we want to see within that system. But now talking of butterflies, now South Africa is quite a diverse country and this extends into butterflies as well. So we've got 671 species in the country and that's quite peculiar for, for a country this far um, south of the equator. So it's something that we need to look at and something we need to understand and essentially to protect these species. Now, butterflies are more than just a pretty face. Um, they are very good at um, indicators um, for a system. And these are down to various factors, um, and this includes how they utilize vegetation. So butterflies utilize vegetation differently in their various life stages. 
So when they are in the larval stage, they tend to chew plants, whereas they, in the adult phase, they utilize the nectar. So there's this dual dependency, and in most cases, these plants aren't the same. So finding a species of butterfly would imply then that some of the criteria have already been met, but let me not get ahead of myself on that, more on that later. So now uh, we start with the study area. It might seem familiar. Um, so we are in the central area of the um, Kruger National Park. It might sound familiar. Um, in the Satara region, the basalts. Um, so for context, we are about there. It's about a two hours drive north, just left of the lions. If you see the cheetah, you've gone too far. <laughs> so in terms of this area, it's a pretty low rainfall area, about 500 millimeters. So it's not a lot, so you won't expect a lot. And then in terms of mean annual temperature, we are in the range of 22. So it's a bit of a harsh system. So the question would then be, why would uh, you do butterfly research there as opposed to the swimming pool and camp? Now, it's an easy question to answer. And it's thanks to the Kruger National Park that created the experimental burnt plots in 1954. Now, these serve as essentially a pretty good test bed for various fire and herbivory related questions. And luckily, they let me run around there and test my hypothesis that fire has an influence on butterflies. Now, just to break down, as you can see, it's quite a large area with various treatments. But for the sake of my experiment, we only focused on three treatments. This being in the green, we've got the triannual. This means it's burnt every three years. In the yellow, we've got the annual, implying it's burnt every year. And as the name suggests, the unburnt is left unburnt. It's uh, quite self-explanatory in that regard. So just to run down um, exactly how we went about this. So the first instance is we had to do capture and release. I know this sounds quite easy, but it's very important to familiarize yourself with the species that you'll find in terms of how they fly, how high they fly, their colors, and all those things. And, and the reason behind this will be clear within a moment. And then there is some tangible evidence that I was there with my butterfly net looking dramatically into the distance. So when we then move on to the important spot, the vegetation and the forb um, sampling, it consisted of the one by one meter squared um, trans plots. And the premise is that within this randomly placed one by one meter plot, you would identify all of the vegetation, you would estimate the cover of these, and then you would have a bunch of them and they would serve as a good indicator of the species composition of that specific um, EBP, or treatment um, rather. And then where things get interesting is the um, transect walks, and these are modified from Pollard and Yates. So basically what it boils down to is a lot of walking. Um, so if I can explain it in this way, so we've got a 100 meter length that's separated by 20 meters, and these 20 meters is quite important as it limits um, a double counting of specific individuals. And then this is done in a manner that is repeatable throughout of them in various days as to have a nice average in terms of what you can expect. And then, as you can see there, all individuals within a five meter radius of the transect, they were noted, and this is why one has to be familiar with what you can expect. Um, so for the people that are excited to do this, just a, a word of warning. Butterflies are most active from 11 till three in the summer in the Kruger. So you, 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 you understand my warning. So it's about 40 degrees out and you have to concentrate on butterflies. So if you want to do it, be prepared, please. So just to summarize my data um, across multiple days, we have a, th um, a total of just shy of 1,700 individuals. And then as you can see, the majority of them were found in the no burn plots of Satara and Nuanetsi respectively. But there's something I would like to note, and that is in terms of the amount of um, species we found. So of those 1,700 individuals, we found 23, and then 20 of them were found in the Satara trinial plot. So that's something I would like um, you to note um, for later. OK, and then we can break it down further. We've got, of the 23 species, these 11 constitute 82% of the counts. So these guys are what you're going to find most likely for the late season, and for this reason, I would like to explore them a bit further. So up there, we've got the grass yellows because they're yellow and they're in amongst grasses. 
self-explanatory luckily we've got the tips we've got the veins we've got the jokers and we've got the pansy so these are just the common names for for anyone that's interested okay now i started this off with vegetation being a core concept and i think most of people have kind of lost it in the sense that i can see a lot of question marks so how we link butterflies and vegetation is through their larval host plant species. So this is just a chart. So these are the butterflies we found within the area, and then these are all of their known um, larval host plants. And then these in green are the ones that we found within each of the treatments, and then these are the ones we're going to look at briefly now. So in essence, how it works is that eggs are deposited onto these um, larval host plants, and then as soon as they hatch, they can start feeding. Think of it like being born on a Big Mac. Essentially, you're on your food source, you start eating, and then you just create ready to run around. So that's in essence what it boils down to. So now, when we start to look at essentially how the vegetation and the butterflies correlate, now this example is the one you show your supervisor first, because this is the one that has the best results. So as per usual, I will be starting with this one. So as we can see, we've got a bunch of individuals in the annual treatment. We've got a, a pretty nice count in terms of their host plants, and then we've got 2.8% cover of the specific plant. Now that increases for 103 individuals in the trennial, and once more we find that there are more of their relative larval host plants. So, so that makes sense. And then we've got a drop-off at the Noburn site in Satara. Once more, that makes sense in terms of the larval host, because now we only find two individuals, and then a mean cover of a percent. And then this is where it gets fun. Now we've got 55, once more it's reflected, we've got 69, we've got three, and then 304 individuals, and 11. So you can see that this essentially abides that what we thought, that the more um, larval plants we have, um, the more individuals we'll see, and that is kind of reflected in this data. But before I move on to the next species, I'd just like to note, you see there's a big difference in terms of the grass yellows you did find at the no burns respective of the two treatments. So now this comes into play in the next slide where we have the biblia. So these are the jokers. And then right off the bat, you can see there's a nice big spike in the no burn of Satara. So it's, it's in the sense that that niche is occupied by the jokers rather than um, it is with the grass yellows. And, and that's partially down to the fact that there is a nice significant amount of larval host plants um, for them to utilize. So that essentially complements each other, and then this is where things get a bit more tricky. So as you can see now, we've got 1% and 4% and none were found in the trennial. So, so that's where we kind of potentially lose the plot for, for what we're trying to discuss. And then um, these two were examples of, of uh, individuals with relatively high counts. So the next example will be the pansies. Um, so you can see we've got a single one found at the annual. We've got three, and then the maximum is up to 10. So this is just to illustrate that um, in terms of the lesser found species, there's also some tendencies. But um, one thing I would like to point out here is the 38% of, of 38 individuals there for 7.7% um, cover. So you see, that's where things start to get uh, more complex. And now we get back to this chart. And to a certain degree, I have explained why we have a lot of individuals in the no burn. But there are still some questions as to, I mean, the data kind of reflects that, but not to this extreme extent. Um, so for that, we, we need to delve a little bit deeper into exactly what um, butterflies require as um, environmental parameters. And we have now covered essentially the food part, but now we need to think about the environment as a structure. So, for example, we um, were there late last year in March, February, and then there were some windy days. And I would start out at the annual, and then there was significant drop-off in terms of activity. So we would have like an 80% drop-off in activity, and I mean, those days were excluded. But then, on that same day, with the same wind speed, if you go to the no burn, you'll find almost no drop-off. There would be 10% differences in terms of a non-windy day as compared to a windy day, and, and that's basically down to the structure. So wind speed is drastically reduced by turbulence and drag. So 
you'd sit there in amongst the tall grasses and you would feel like it's a normal day, the sun has chosen you as its victim, it's 40 degrees, it's measurable, but then you get to the annual plot and then once more it feels like a windy day, it's more chill. So, so understand that butterflies utilize that in terms of structure. And now we come at perhaps a very awkward place in, in my talk is that does this mean that I am advocating for no birds? And no, no I'm not. So essentially what it boils down to is that it looks like a mosaic burning program is essentially something that they would utilize effectively. What I mean with this is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all program in which we burn everything and then start anew. It's in this essence a mosaic in terms of there's an area that's burnt the last two seasons. There's an area that hasn't burned for a few seasons. though, So that there is a bit of difference in terms of the structure and the species composition and all of these things, just to accommodate essentially the butterflies. And, and this will have an impact in, in terms of how the species are found and, and, and what you find. And then, like I said, this mosaic is also important in terms of forbs. And, and forbs act as most important for butterflies. And, and, and this is what stimulates the amount we will find in the species richness. So, so this burning program, in essence, will basically ensure that there is a plethora of food and essentially that there is a larger diversity. And then I also want just to remind that this was done in the late season, so there weren't as many flowering plants. Um, so that might have an influence in terms of, of what we would find. So I would expect that if we want to do this again in, in the early season of the, of the start of the rainy season and there's a lot of flowering plants, I think that the composition would be different as opposed to, I think the trineal would be um, more utilized than these things. This is speculation, but that's a, something that I would really like to explore in the future, just to establish whether or not um, what I believe will be true. And then, also, it's, it's, it's not as simple as that. You, you, you can't have a species-focused approach into a burning program. And there's a lot of things that come into place, some things that are very complex, and, and this is a bit of an advertisement, but my friends and colleagues, they will be up later in the session, and, and they will be exploring some additional aspects of, of fire and how this influences the seed bank and the bud banks and these kind of things. So, so the idea was not to, to, to illustrate that butterflies are this perfect cure for how we need to approach fire, but something that can have a tangible indicator of, of um, what we want to see and, and and things we can take into account when, when we look at um, how fire influences the environment. And uh, with that, if, if somebody is in the mood for some uh, light reading, uh, we've got some nice references there. And then that will be the end. Um, time permitting, um, any questions? Thank you. Uh, there, aren't, there is no time for questions, uh, but our next speaker uh, is going to be uh, Anga, who is going to be telling us about lizard responses to experimental fire regimes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, my name is Anga Rahmansa. Uh, uh, I'm from Charles Darwin University, PhD student, and I'm supervised by Alan Anderson, uh, but I'm working on lizard, not ants or insects. And it seems I'm, I get the benefit uh, for presenting last uh, from my group uh, who work in Territory Wildlife Park because uh, Alan has, uh, d has done nicely in his, his presentation on termite uh, and Francois also in, in ants, and that fit in into my talk. And that's the useful of ants and termites feeding on lizards. Uh, but it, at the same time, they put much pressure for me because they put set, uh, uh, set a high bar uh, in their presentation. Uh, so I think uh, Alan and Francois already did a good job uh, in introducing you uh, about the Australian tropical savanna. So I just briefly move on uh, for this slide. Uh, so yeah, uh, as Francois mentioned uh, previously, uh, uh, top, Australian tropical savanna is uh, highly flammable, and it's burned every year. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, the intensity is very in early uh, season. Uh, the intensity is low, and in late dry season, is high. Uh, so it, fire is important in tropical savanna for biodiversity, but 
At the same time, if, if not managed uh, well, uh, it can threaten biodiversity. And there's some evidence in Northern Australia it contribute to the decline of small mammals. Uh, but how about reptiles uh, or lizards? Uh, it's still poorly understood. And so for Australia itself, uh, lizard is highly uh, exceptional, actually. Uh, it has high diversity. And actually, Australia is the highest uh, uh, lizard listeners in the world, uh, so the biodiversity hotspot. And biogeographically, biogeographically uh, lizards in Australia uh, come from the Asia continent, uh, and but some, some of them like uh, divers in the arid uh, adapted area, such this uh, genus Stenatus uh, and uh, the monitor lizard. Uh, but most of them like uh, associated with moist or close open uh, close habitat. Uh, so you see this picture again, uh, the Territorial Wildlife Park. Uh, so yeah, most uh, we have like six different treatment: uh, burn every year, burn early burn every two years, every uh, late burn every two years, and uh, every three year early uh, burn, and early burn every five years, and unburn. Uh, so, what is what we know about the lizard response uh, in this tropical savanna? So, from when the experiment started in 2003, uh, uh, so Evelyn did some uh, sampling uh, before and after, before and after, uh, after immediately after uh, the burning, and uh, she only focused on skin and. There's no uh, significant difference in the abundance or the capture. So that means no significant direct mortality uh, from fire, which Francois also already highlighted in his presentation. Uh, so, but uh, what is the uh, medium or long term effect of uh, fire to lizard? And what is the mechanism that drives them uh, to respond to fire? As Francois already highlighted, many studies have been conducted uh, how uh, fauna respond to fire, uh, but mostly they only look the phenomenological response to fire, and they it does uh, they doesn't they don't look uh, the mechanism how they respond to fire. Uh, so uh, yeah, my. PhD project uh, is focused on the mechanism, how the lizard uh, respond to fire. And we think probably because uh, ecophysiological factor maybe drive lizard respond to fire. Uh, so as Francois already mentioned in his presentation, like fire uh, open up more habitat and it influence uh, the direct insulation uh, uh, to the habitat and influence the microclimate and lizard uh, ectotherm animal. So they thermoregulate the fluctuation of uh, thermal environment. Uh, so thermal uh, is important for them. Uh, while they're thermoregulatory, uh, they also lost a lot of water. So water availability also limit their uh, ability to thermoregulatory. And there's at least two paper uh, that look into this, and one specifically focused on fire, but the other one focused generally on habitat modification. And yeah, this paper uh, found some evidence that uh, ecophysiology uh, drive uh, uh, lizard respond to fire. And how about in uh, tropical uh, savannah of Australia? Uh, so the prediction is uh, uh, the response of lizard will be very across space and time. And it will be distinct as, as the time increasing since the fire uh, started, and also the, the difference will be more distinct between the most extreme fire regime. Uh, for example, in my case, is from annually burned and unburned. And the prediction is the open or avid adaptive species will be advantaged by fire, uh, and it has lower water loss uh, and higher thermal preference, while the close or mesic adapted species uh, will be disadvantaged by fire and will be higher uh, uh, water loss and lower thermal preference. So to test this, I'll, I'm doing field experiments and lab-based experiments. 
So for my talk here, I will focus on the long-term effect uh, for the field experiment, and for the lab-based experiment, I only I will only focus on the thermal preference. Uh, so for my field sampling, uh, so in one hectare plot, uh, I I had three difference line uh, with 50 meters difference and 30 centimeter high, and for its difference, uh, I have a pitfall trap, uh, four pitfall trap, and three pair of uh, funnel trap, and uh, uh, six. Uh, cover board uh, to look for arboreal uh, species. Uh, so I only sample in for uh, fire tri treatment, uh, burn every three years, burn every one year, burn every early, burn every five years, and unburn. And for my physiological sample, uh, I only sample from the most extreme uh, fire regime, uh, from the annually burn and from the unburn. Uh, for my lab, lab experiment, so for the preferred body temperature, uh, I put the lizard in the glass uh, terrarium uh, with, uh, that has a heat lamp at one end, uh, so it will create a gradient of temperature between 50 to 20 degrees Celsius, and it has crevice. If the lizard feel too hot, they can hide under the crevice. And I measure the body temperature hourly for 12 hours. Uh, so this is for my evaporative water loss. Uh, so basically, I use the open flow system uh, where I put, I put lizard in the chamber, and I pump dry air to the chamber, and I measure the difference between uh, the humidity when the chamber is em empty and when the animal is on the chamber. So this is my preliminary result uh, for the long-term uh, uh, impact of fire. Uh, so for species sweetness, uh, it seems there's pattern that uh, when the, uh, the fire uh, is more frequent, uh, the species sweetness is uh, decreasing, with the exception of the, uh, of the plot that burn every five years. Uh, and it seems because uh, this uh, plot accommodate habitat uh, for close uh, species and for open uh, adapted species, which, uh, which also highlighted in Francois' uh, presentation, actually. Uh, and there's some variation also uh, in the impact of uh, fire to the species witness. Uh, and it's, if you still remember Francois' presentation, he highlighted that there's a lot of variation in the fire intensity. Uh, which uh, may create different uh, vegetation texture also, uh, even if it's, it's from this uh, the same uh, fire treatment. And for species abundance, uh, it seems so the same pattern like species fitness, uh, although it might be not significant, uh, but uh, yeah, the trend is decreasing with, with, the, with more frequent fire. And so most of my Capture actually uh, this rainbow king, Carlia rufilatus, uh, and Stenatus asingtoniae. Uh, so they both widely uh, distributed in all fire treatment. Uh, but the interesting thing is uh, Galafero uh, Stenatus robustus, which is diverse in more arid adapted uh, species. Uh, it's more likely found in frequent fire plot. And Glaviromorphus, uh, which is associated to close uh, canopy habitat, more frequently found in less uh, frequent fire plot. Uh, so, so for the species composition, uh, yeah, it seems that there's, there's a distinction uh, between uh, the most extreme fire regime, uh, the annually burned plot, and the Unburn plot, and yeah, the unburned plot is closely uh, to the five years uh, burn plot, and it's also overlapped with the three years burn plot. And now looking at the, my thermal preference, so for my thermal preference, I'm also looking uh, if the species uh, 
who, lo who love uh, in who love uh, frequently fire uh, and unburned plot uh, will have a different uh, physiology trait, and it seems uh, there's no d difference uh, for the same species who live in different who found in different plot, and there's no difference also in the season. So this is for the two species that widely distributed. Uh, it seems their uh, thermal average thermal preference is uh, almost similar uh, in both treatment and both season, dry season and wet season. And it's the same thing for the geckos also. Uh, their thermal preference is similar, uh, except for Stenotus robustus, uh, which is more arid adapted. Uh, it it seems the the one that found in burn and uh, burn treatment. Uh, in dry season has slightly higher thermal preference compared to uh, the individual found in other treatment and in different season. And if we look uh, the thermal preference, the, the physiological trait, uh, uh, the thermal preference for interspecies, uh, it seems there's consistent uh, pattern uh, where, uh, oops, where graphilomorphous. Uh, who love, uh, who favor less frequent fire, uh, they have uh, the lowest thermal preference compared to other species. And Stenotus robustus, uh, uh, who favor more frequent fire, have the highest uh, thermal preference. And it seems like uh, their thermal preference is the same for uh, different uh, season. Uh, and the species that widely distributed has medium thermal preference, also has the white has the widest uh, range of thermal compared to the other species. And for the next step, I'll be looking uh, if uh, other environmental variable like Francois, like uh, the fire intensity and vegetation structure will be best to predict uh, lizard uh, species species and abundance and to see if the water loss also has the same pattern with the thermal preference. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for one question. Okay then, uh, up next we have Mary who will be telling us about savanna soil carbon. Um, hi everyone, I'm uh, Mary and I'm a PhD student at Oh, thank you, at um, Lancaster University. Um, and broadly, my PhD is about the impact of fire and herbivory on soil properties here in Kruger. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about my first chapter, which was some work we did here on the experimental burn plots on the impact of fire intensity on soil respiration. Um, so savannas cover about 20% of the earth, and like most terrestrial ecosystems, they store substantial carbon in their soils. Soil carbon storage relies on these interacting biological processes. So quite simply, um, carbon dioxide is absorbed by the plants through photosynthesis. Um, this is stored in the soil as soil organic matter, which is then decomposed by microbes. And as microbes respire, they release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So, Soil carbon storage is a vital ecosystem service that relies on these interactions of photosynthesis, respiration, and microbial decomposition. Um, but human activities and um, global change drivers such as climate change, atmospheric warming, land use change could lead to significant changes to the biological processes regulating soil carbon. So fires are a natural part of the savanna landscape. We know that above ground they shape savanna vegetation and they're essential for biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. And we know globally that fires do impact microbial communities, uh, both directly by killing the microbes or indirectly by changing their environment, changing their carbon source, changing the pH of the soil. Specifically of interest for this project uh, was fire intensity. 
So um, in savannas, fire intensity is um, often used as a management technique, and we know there's lots of factors that feed into different um, fire intensities. The um, intensity of savanna fires are known to drive changes in plant community composition that alter the quantity and quality of carbon inputs into the soil. And if the quantity and quality of carbon inputs into the soil changes, this changes carbon cycling, microbial activity, and soil carbon storage. Um, so um, changes to these processes can either lead to increased soil carbon storage or um, carbon loss from the soils. Um, so the key question we had for this project was how do differences in fire intensity affect soil carbon cycling and microbial activity, which we measure as respiration. So the reason we're really interested in fire intensity is because these global change drivers of climate change, atmospheric warming, are going to result in different kinds of fires, um, which could vary in fire intensity. We don't know a lot about fire intensity's impact on microbial communities because a lot of the work that's been done on the impact of fire on microbes has been done post wildfires, really, really intense fires, and mainly in forests. So we want to know, you know, we are learning lots about um, the carbon in the soil here in Africa, and we know compared to globally that our soil organic carbon stocks are quite low. So it's really vital that we protect the carbon that's currently in the soil, um, and we need to understand how fire intensity may impact this. Um, so we use the long-term experimental burn plots here in um, Kruger, um, and we sampled at the wettest replicates in Pretoria Scott, which get about 700 millimeters of rainfall um, a year. And we sampled a subset of the three treatments. So we um, sampled along the fire suppression um, plots, which have been unburnt for nearly seven decades now. And then we also sampled on two near natural landscape averages that burn every three years. And we um, focused on two seasons, so on December and August. So in December, it's um, rainy season, the fuel is a lot greener. These are much more low intensity fires and often much more patchy fires. Um, in August, it's towards the end of the dry season, the fuel's really dried out, it's very dry fuel, and they're much more um, intense fires and often um, much more successful fires. Um, so we collected soil cores along a transect in all of these treatments um, to a depth of eight centimeters um, last April. So how do we study these dynamic microbial processes um, in these soil cores? So microbial activity in soil is limited by the availability and quality of resources, especially if there is a carbon soils. And these soils in Pretoria Scott are granitic soils, so they're very sandy soils. Um, and when you have soil carbon in the soil, the more clay that is in the soil, the better protected that soil organic carbon is from the microbes um, from decomposition. So there's no clay in these um, sandy soils, so they are very carbon limited soils to start with. So one common approach to study microbes and their respiration in these carbon-limited soils has been to give the microbes an easily available carbon source like glucose, which is one of the simplest sugars. So if you have your carbon-limited soil, you give them some carbon, you take away that limitation, and you um, track the microbial response, which is measured as soil respiration, which is simply just the amount of carbon dioxide coming off the soil. So we did this um, in a laboratory, and we also know that temperature and moisture affects soil uh, microbial activity. So we kept it at a constant temperature and a constant moisture. So any changes in microbial respiration was going to be to do with that carbon um, substrate ad addition. Um, and so we chose glucose, which is uh, one of the simplest um, sugars, and we added it to half of these paired cores at the beginning of the experiment. So we added glucose to one of the cores um, in a solution, and then we just added water to the other core. And then over the period of a month, at several time points, um, 
we measured the respiration using an infrared gas analyzer. Um, and we got some really interesting results. So I'll just explain the graph. So uh, along here we have the days post-glucose addition. So this is after the glucose has been added. And here we have the additional flux, which is the additional respiration. And this is the respiration that's due to the additional carbon being added in. This is the respiration from the glucose. Um, and we got quite a classic response in terms of microbial respiration in response to the substrate in that we have um, a bit of a lag phase here in days one to day two, followed by a growth phase, um, and then followed in a decline in activity after peak rates here. And we found at peak rates, so day 10 and day 14, that these carbon substrate-induced respiration rates, so these glucose-induced respiration rates, were greatest in these August soils, so these high-intensity fire soils. We didn't see any difference between the low-intensity fires, the December fires, and the fire suppression plots. Um, but this may be because it's um, a, a long-term experiment, these um, these soils have come from, and they're also from the wetter replicates. So the above ground vegetation on um, the December triennial pots and the fire suppression plots are very similar. So they're having very similar carbon inputs into the soil. So once you give them that substrate, they're having quite a similar microbial response as they're used to having very similar carbon inputs into the soil. But why are we seeing um, much higher respiration rates for the high-intensity fires. So this is because the soils with the high-intensity fires seem to be more carbon-limited. So these soils are more carbon-limited, and um, once you give them effectively that extra energy, they start to use it up, and so they respire at a much higher rate, which is why we get much higher um, respiration rates um, for these. And this, again, is due to the changes in the above-ground vegetation so the higher intensity fires, uh, they're much hotter fires, so um, they burn away a lot more of the above ground vegetation. So these plots are much more open. So they're having very different quality and quantity of carbon inputs into the soil compared to the low intensity and the fire suppression plots. Um, and this will cause differences in microbial carbon stocks. So how do differences in fire intensity affect soil carbon cycling and respiration? So these different responses to this glucose addition suggest that fire intensity can drive changes in soil microbial respiration. Across all the plots in these granitic soils, we're starting with a very, even pre-glucose, we're starting with a very low baseline in terms of the levels of the respiration. Um, but it, also suggests that these fire, higher fire intensity, that the um, microbial activity may be become more limited with, the, with carbon, by carbon availability. And this means that the microbes are effectively being much more dormant and they're waiting for those carbon inputs so they can use the carbon. Um, and this could have a potential effect on the carbon stocks. Um, so some further work we're going to be doing on these plots. We're also going to look at the microbial community composition. So this is um, the ratios of bacteria to fungi. Um, so we can really understand how, perhaps how there's shifts in communities um, due to different fire intensities and also due to those changing um, above ground vegetation, which is changing the carbon inputs into the soil and also just soil biogeochemical properties. So the carbon stocks and nitrogen stocks and the phosphorus stocks. Um, so thank you to everyone that helped on this project and a big thanks to Tertia as well because my project would never happen without Tertia. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for two questions. Um, so, with the block design, we actually did Shabeni, Kambeni, and Numbi, and we didn't do the Fai string uh, because of some differences in the soil properties there. And then we did um, four soil cores along a transect in each uh, plot 
in each seven hectare plot. Yes, but at every location you only took one soil sample or did you take replicates? At each. At each spot along the transect. Because, I mean, you have small scale variation of soil properties. How do you. Yeah, um, this is always a problem that. in soil science. Um, so yes, we just. It is. Yeah. <laughs> you just, we've accounted for it by doing a transect of four um, within that plot. And then obviously we have the replicates of the treatment across the Pretorioscope as well. So it's. You have to stop at some point how many replicates you're going to do. I can't do 500 glucose. Well, I could, but I would never finish my PhD. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what we settled on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks for some really lovely and new and interesting data. Um, I discovered talking to some sort of chemists and biogeochemists last year, that intense fires can create these kind of pyro sugars, so that intense fires often actually increase the glucose and sugar levels temporarily in a landscape. Um, is it possible that your results, your massive response to glucose, could be because the high intensity plots have a community that responds to glucose because they get these pyro sugars frequently? Yeah, so that's why I really want to look at the microbial community composition as well, so we can have a look at which kind of parts of the community are responding to that glucose. But also, Tertia and Carla and I are doing a side project on how pyro sugars post fires on the ECBPs are influencing microbial respiration. So maybe next year we can answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Up next, we have Mariska Tobias, who's going to tell us how fire and biodiversity contribute to carbon storage. Hello, everyone. Um, so, let me first see how this works. So, I'm going to talk today about um, fire, biodiversity, and carbon storage. Um, but I'll take you from the savannas um, into uh, some of our beautiful montane grasslands. So, what actually led me to start up this research is this um, threat of afforestation that we heard about yesterday. So, um, Nikki and also Kate gave great presentations on um, what is currently um, yeah, happening um, worldwide with climate mitigation uh, programs. Um, and so that led me to think, so what, um, how can these grassy ecosystems contribute to our um, narratives on climate change mitigation? And um, what are solutions that we as a, as a grassland community can offer, like the, the global community, to come up with alternative narratives um, for these, uh, these grassy biomes. Um, and what opportunities can we find to, um, to say like these grassy biomes are equally important um, as these um, afforested ecosystems that, that people think are um, sequestering so much, much carbon. Um, and at the same time, you need a common language. So that's why um, I focus it on carbon. Um, but what I think we miss in this whole debate on climate change is we miss the diversity component. So um, going in there, planting trees in highly diverse ecosystems and then still uh, not caring about uh, the biodiversity loss, I think is a, is a, is a big, big problem. Um, and we need to find a way to link this climate change uh, debate to um, our biodiversity loss. Um, and that led me to the question, um, the overall question, can biodiversity in these grassy ecosystems um, help mitigate climate change uh, through their carbon um, storage potential? So like I said, I will take you to these Afro-Montane grasslands. They're beautiful, they're very highly diverse. And actually, to be honest, I think we shouldn't call them grasslands. I think we should call them foreplants. Um, they have these beautiful um, flora. And um, sadly, they have, they're highly threatened. So only 2% of these grasslands is formally protected. Um, they are a very important reservoir of uh, soil carbon. Um, and the main threats include climate warming, um, intensified land use, so not only 
um, altered land use, but also intensification, more intense fire, more intense herbivory, um, and of course, all of these afforestation practices. Another big one that I don't mention here, but I know some people in the audience work on, is plowing, which is also um, a big, big problem for these grasslands, so plowing them up uh, for croplands, because they're often very fertile grasslands. So what is key in these grasslands is that fire uh, plays a big role. And this flora, this unique flora of these grasslands um, is mostly fire adapted. And one of the hypotheses that I want to test is that this fire adapted flora is especially important for the carbon dynamics um, in these grasslands. Um, and I have three main mechanisms and hypothesized mechanisms uh, for this. Um, so we all hear about the negative uh, with carbon emissions from, uh, from intense fires. But what we know much less about, and that was also what Mary beautifully illustrated in her talk, uh, there's difference in fire intensity. And these grassland fires often burn with a much lower intensity than, for example, here your savanna fires or even forest fires. So if you have these much cooler uh, grassland fires, could they actually promote carbon storage um, by incorporating these, this black ash into the soil. Um, and that is actually something that is used a lot in agriculture, where they use biochar into their soils to promote carbon storage in their soil. And this might be something that is just happening in our grasslands because of these cooler fires. So that is one hypothesis um, that I will talk a bit more about. Um, then the second hypothesis that I want to explore is these underground storage organs. So because this flora is fire adapted, a lot of the carbon is stored below ground because these plants need to save, um, they need to protect their carbon stocks and their buds from fire. Um, so often these grasslands have these amazing underground storage organs that actually, in a lot of models, root biomass is not incorporated. It's um, the above ground biomass and the soil carbon. Um, but what about these underground storage organs? They might play a very important role. And then finally, as a third hypothesis, um, we have um, diversity productivity relationships that might differ between these very old growth grasslands that are very diverse versus degraded, uh, degraded secondary grasslands. And this is basically a very simple niche complementarity, Tillman like uh, hypothesis where if you have more diversity, you have more functions in your ecosystems, more different root structures, and that might then lead to um, more uh, carbon storage in the, in the root component. Um, so those are the hypotheses that I want to test. I'm not going to do this alone. Um, I got a new research program funded last year, and it will run for the next five years. Um, I have a lot of collaborators, and we managed to get this fantastic team of, uh, of PhD students and one postdoc, um, who all do projects related to these, uh, to these questions. So the focus of this program is really this link between fire, uh, the plant functional diversity, and the soil carbon. And I put all of these pluses here, but I mean, really, it's still... Uh, I should have put question marks, maybe, but this is the hypothesis. Um, and then one of the students will focus specifically also on the impact of climate change. So how does climate change disrupt this, uh, this linkage and this, this triangle? Um, and one of the other students will focus specifically on land use change. So intensified grazing regimes and afforestation. Um, so that is uh, for the future. Now going back to the fire hypothesis, uh, the one on the what is it left hand side for you, um, and this is basically uh, the work by uh, one of my students, Nikki Finlay, who is in the audience here. So you can direct all of the diff difficult questions to her later on. <laughs> um, and what we used is we have this. I work in this Brotherton fire experiment, which is in the Cathedral Peak area in the Drakensberg. Um, and these are plots, so this is the whole, uh, this is part of the fire experiment. You see all of these poles here, so they're 25 by 25 meter blocks of um, areas that, that are burned either annually, biannually, 
every five years or uh, they're bur not burned at all. Um, and they have spring burns in the early season and autumn burns in the late season. Um, so one, one of the th experiments that we're doing here is these open top chambers to uh, elevate temperatures. So that is for the PhD student who will work on the, on the climate change question. Um, but what, what Nikki did is she looked at how do these different fire treatments affect the soil carbon storage. And for that, we, um, we took soil cores and we measured, Nikki measured, <laughs> Uh, soil organic carbon, soil organic nitrogen. And what we found is that these annual spring burns come out way higher uh, than all the other treatments, um, both in nitrogen and in carbon. And when we found this, we couldn't really understand why, especially the spring annual burns are so much higher in carbon. Um, so we looked at CN ratios, there's not a disturbing effect there, so they're all the same. Um, so part of the explanation could be due to that these are very clayey soils, um, so they're probably in soil properties the complete opposite that was uh, what, uh, what Mary just showed. Um, but yeah, so they store more carbon in the more frequently burned soils. So what Nikki also found is that the carbon stocks in the top five centimeters um, is about 90 to 111 um, megagrams carbon per hectare. And um, I did this quick translation, um, which is probably not completely accurate, but a lot of these um, very high montane grassland soils are estimated to be about 200, um, which then translates to the top 30 centimeters, right? So not the top 15 centimeters. Anyway, our result is that we d only did the top 15 centimeters and that we have about 100 megagrams carbon per hectare. But then I was like, so what is this? What does this number mean? How does that compare? And then I found this very nice paper by um, a student of Carla, and I think there are many co-authors here in the, in the room. And I was actually very surprised to see yesterday night, last night, that these axes are actually the same. So the amount of carbon stored in these grasslands is huge, right? Because this is the carbon here, this is the whole ecosystem carbon storage of the annual burn, of the burn trials here in the Kruger National Park. Um, and then, so the, 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 the scale of the soil organic carbon in the top 15 centimeters in these grassland soils is similar order of magnitude of the whole ecosystem carbon storage in, um, in these burn uh, plots. So, <laughs> I don't know, maybe Carla, we should sit down and see if this is really true. Um, but at least we know that these soils in these grasslands are unique in their properties, in their clay properties, and in how they uh, store carbon. Um, what we could also do is this um, comparison between an earlier study by Manson et al. in 2007, um, which is um, actually in the same lab as where Nikki is based. So we used exactly the same method, exactly the same um, protocols, and then we could see that these old growth grasslands continue to sequester carbon um, over, these, uh, over these many years of 0.3 megagrams uh, per year per hectare. Okay, so this is about sequestration, but how persistent is this carbon, right? You want to go a little bit further. You not only want to know what is in the soil, but you want to know in which form is this carbon in the soil? And is it, so we, we heard in the previous talk about the soil microbes and how they can then take up the carbon and respire it again. So we want this carbon to be in very stable components. Um, so this particular organic matter, the POM, is basically just the plant parts. And that is, it's a quite labile form. So it can still, the, the microbes can, can take it up and it can be uh, respired back. But you also have this mineral associated carbon where it really gets uh, linked to clay particles or to other partic particles. So it really gets um, very um, stuck for a long time in the soil. And then you have this pyrocarbon. So if you look at the carbon persistence in, uh, in years uh, or in at least some kind of time scale, um, your particular organic carbon would be uh, most labile uh, whereas your pyrocarbon would be most stable. 
So then, um, with Nikki samples, Nikki soil samples, so the exact same soil samples as we used in the previous study, uh, we had this master student who then started fractionating these samples. And what he found is that in these samples, the majority of the carbon is actually stored in the mineral associated matter. So these are highly stable forms of carbon. And to explain the treatments here, I didn't do that in Nikki's work, by the way, sorry for that. <laughs> um, so um, these are only the spring burns, so Nikki also included the autumn burns, but these are only the spring burns, the annual spring burn, the biannual spring, these are five-year burns and these are no burns. Um, so then we also looked at pyrocarbon. So we had this protocol where we um, burned, off pyro, burned off the carbon at different uh, temperature levels with a thermogravimetric analysis. And then you can actually, at a certain uh, temperature threshold, uh, you burn off the, uh, the pyrocarbon. Um, and then you can get an estimate of the pyrocarbon. And you can actually see that in these grassland soils, the, the most of the, carbon uh, the pyrocarbon is also found in the more regular uh, burned areas. And what is really nice is that this is now a proper grassland, so there's no woody species here. Um, whereas if you would do this in a savanna, the majority of your pyrocarbon would likely come from your woody biomass, because the woody biomass burns less, you have bigger pieces of ash from the, um, from the woody species incorporated into your soils. Um, but it's very nice to see that we also have this pyrocarbon um, in the soils here, and that they are higher in the more regularly burned treatments, as we would expect. So then to conclude, these uh, montane grasslands are very important reservoirs of uh, soil organic carbon. Um, specifically, this, this old growth grassland stores quite a lot of carbon, 100 me megagrams um, carbon per hectare in the top 15 centimeters, and important, it continues to sequester carbon. Um, we found the highest amounts of carbon in the annual spring burns, um, and that leads us to believe that if you have these regular cool fires, so not the intense fires, the cool fires, um, they may promote soil carbon storage. And maybe that is part of the reason why these grasslands have such an enormous um, high uh, amount of soil carbon in their soils. So the next step is to look deeper into the role of, uh, role of plant diversity in these systems and the interlinkages between um, the carbon and the plant diversity. And I do hope, and yeah, that's the vision, that this work will in the end create greater awareness of the importance of these grassy ecosystems and also that we realize what we are about to lose if we allow tree planting programs to go ahead. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, there is unfortunately no time for questions. Our last speaker is Tasha, and she'll be telling us about the fire effects on soil properties. Cool. Okay. Me again, <laughs> from two hours earlier this morning. So yeah, I'll be talking about fire effects on soil properties in a large African conservation area, i.e. Kruger. Um, and when one thinks of a large conservation area, this is often what people think about. They think about, you know, the big um, charismatic animals that we have in the park, which I like to term as our money makers, which is true. Um, but as we know from the wide variety of talks that we have around here, there are other important processes and interactions that play in this landscape um, that drive how these guys also use the landscape. So when we look at soil and their relevance in the broader scheme of conservation, the World Conservation Strategy already in 1980 made um, reference to soils uh, with a spoke about aiming to maintain essential ecological processes, um, ecological processes and life support systems such as soil regeneration and protection, and then even the 2020 Living Planet report that spoke about the role of soil and the biodiversity in the overall assessment of the world's biodiversity. So when we get to fires in Kruger, as we've heard, 
throughout the session already, and you will be hearing until the end of the day. Fire is our key abiotic factor, um, um, driving ecosystem um, dynamics in African savannas, and these fires are ignited either by people, um, sometimes on purpose, sometimes by accident, um, and we do also have lightning fires um, as a natural cause in this landscape, but they are less common. Just out of interest, this is a GIF file of one of our experimental fires in the Satara region of the park. So on average, we have roughly about 10% of Kruger that burns every year. That doesn't sound a lot, but it's 200,000 hectares. And then just out of interest, this map over here is following um, the fires that we had in 2021. We had roughly 20% of Kruger burning because of the high fuel loads that we had following um, really good rains in the season before that. So it's around 400,000 hectares. Um, and this is just fire scar map of roughly what 10% of Kruger being burnt looks like. So if you look at uh, fire and soil research in the country, there generally is a long and rich history of fire-related research in the country that we can tell by um, the literature review during these talks. We know this. But with regards to local studies looking at fire effects on soil properties, there's a scarcity in those kinds of studies. So why do we care? Well, one, there's a high prevalence of fire throughout the country. Roughly 70% or so of the country is in a fire-driven uh, biome, whether it's the Fainbos down in the Cape, whether it's the savannas, whether it's the grasslands up in the high fault. Fire is very prevalent in our landscapes. And then worldwide studies um, from other parts of the world have found fire effects on soil, on soil properties elsewhere. So this interaction be between fires and soils um, is there and has been seen in other landscapes. And then also this historical perception, which is still somewhat a current perception as well, that fires have a negative impact on soils. And then just out of interest, um, in South Africa in 1946, there was even a national legislation put into place that actually pr prohibited any um, prescribed burning across the country because of this idea that these fires are going to have negative effects on soils and it's going to lead to land degradation and soil erosion. So if you look specifically within Kruger, there are very few studies actually looking at fire effects on soil properties um, as a whole. So there's roughly about 15 or so studies only. And then what I did is I divided them up into the brown, which is fire effects on soil chemical like properties, so like the carbon, the nitrogen, um, micronutrients, soil pH, etc. The blue being um, fire effects on soil physical or hydrological properties. And as you can see, there's literally just three. Um, and then with regards to the green, representing fire effects on soil biological properties, so soil respiration, microbes, etc. Um, so like I said, more than two-thirds of studies have looked at fire effects on soil um, chemical properties, which makes sense, soil carbon, nitrogen, relatively easy um, to measure. So yeah, hopefully some of the, like Mary's study, will have another green, and mine, we might have another blue. Um, but those are the kinds of um, properties that are still very sorely lacking in the park. So what we did is um, we used a more than almost 70 year uh, fire experiment in Kruger, so it's about 69 years old currently. And that's a map of Kruger. So there's some experiments down in the south, heading all the way north. But I'm going to speak specifically to this, just in case people are not familiar not familiar with experimental burn plots, but it's a long-term fire and a bovary experiment because they're not fenced off to herbivores in the park, initiated in 1954. They were aimed initially at investigating the uh, influence of various fire frequencies and seasons on four of the major vegetation types in the park, um, and they are across the rainfall gradient and geological gradient. So all the way on the, uh, the granites on the, on the west, basalts on the east, and then around the southwest of around 705 moles per annum, increasing all the way, ah, decreasing, all the way to around 450 moles per annum. And then, just to zoom in a bit, just to give you the scale of this um, fire experiment, um, Ellen spoke so nicely about the fire experiment on that side. Not that it's a competition of fire experiments. Um, I mean, you guys already won acacia and the cricket and but with the rugby, we'll see you guys in September. Um, but we have 16 replicates across the park, so in total, there are 208 burn plots, which is a lot. Um, 
takes a lot of time, money, and effort to maintain it for nearly seven decades, and they are roughly seven hectares each, so I'll just zoom in a bit. If you zoom in just to this Kukuza landscape, there are four replicates in this landscape. If you zoom in just to one of those, that's roughly what the setup looks like. So various times of year that the, that the plots are burnt and various frequencies at which they are burnt, and then also, obviously, the unburnt plot as well. So back to this, to the current research. Um, so I compared the no-burn and the, and the annual plot in the Skukuza landscape, so I used the two extremes. And then I also aim to address some of those key gaps from those limited studies that we've had in the past. So looking at trying to um, recognize the role of herbivores in this landscape, looking at short-term effects, so this was quite, um, quite important because a lot of the previous literature has compared um, a fire suppression plot and an annual plot and then had looked at the long-term effect of those fire regimes on various properties. So with the short-term effects, I wanted to be there before the fire, while the fire is burning because we burn the fires ourselves, and then immediately post-fire and then track that over time. And then the direct versus indirect effects of fire. So um, Francois touched on this nicely during his, his presentation. We basically explained the role that just the change in habitat and vegetation structure could actually lead to the change and not necessarily a direct effect of the fire. Maybe if it's the heat of the fire burning the soil surface or if it's an ash impact afterwards. So yeah, so I concentrated under trees, right, under tree canopies, under shrubs, because that's a more dominant uh, vegetation feature in the landscape, and then in open areas as well. So yeah, so overall objective to determine long-term and short-term effects of fires on soil hydrological and chemical properties. So just um, some of the soil and fire characteristics. So if we looked at taking, uh, looking at the soil texture on all of our plots, they all congregated in the bottom left part of the soil texture triangle because on sandy granitic soils, the fire itself, we burnt in August 2021, fire temperature was ranging at around 500 degrees Celsius, soil temperature peaked at only about 34 degrees Celsius for one second, and then fire intensity was around 1,500 kilowatts per meter. The vegetation that you typically get in this landscape, you will see it once you drive outside the camp, so I'm not going to describe it too much. Um, grass fuel moisture content of only 17%, so very dry, considering that it's August, and then fuel load of roughly 2,700 uh, kilograms per hectare. So I'm going to get into a bit of the results. So when we looked at hydrophobicity, which basically refers to water repellency, so how repellent is the soil surface from allowing water to infiltrate? Um, and what we saw in the short term is that there's no immediate effect of fire, right? So we did this just before we burnt the fire, burnt the fire, and then immediately post fire to see if that heating effect of the fire had any effect on hydrophobicity, and it didn't induce any hydrophobicity immediately post fire. If you look at soil carbon and nitrogen in the long term, so um, what we found is that the no-burn plot where fires have been kept out for roughly seven decades, there is increased soil total carbon as well as total nitrogen. This is nothing new and this is what we expected. So frequent burning does reduce soil carbon and nitrogen. Was this now an indirect effect or was it a direct effect? Right, so is it because of fire suppression on the no-burn plot for seven decades? The vegetation got thicker, more vegetated. Could that be driving the chain, the difference that we've seen in soil carbon and nitrogen? So what we did is we then looked at under trees, under shrubs, under open, um, thank you, in, um, in open areas as well. And basically what we found is that trees and shrubs have a very similar effect in concentrating carbon and nitrogen below the canopies. So previous literature alluded to the effect of the large trees having this um, impact on concentrating these nutrients, but now we see that the shrubs do have, have a very similar effect um, as well. So if you look at soil carbon and nitrogen in the short term, what we also found is that there is also a short-term effect of fire on soil carbon and nitrogen. So this is what we thought would happen post, month, uh, post one month <laughs> after the fire, which makes sense, because there's still a lot of ash in the landscape. Um, but this even lasted up to a year post-fire. There was still higher soil carbon and nitrogen. I think what is quite important um, is that 
You know, to follow up from this, I think it's important that we actually differentiate between the types of carbon and between the types of nitrogen as well, and not just lump it all into being total carbon and total nitrogen. So these are some of the things um, to focus on as we go forward. So to conclude, there was no immediate effect of fire on hydrophobicity in the short term. What about the long term? Still busy analyzing um, that data. Recurring fires have both a long and short term effect on soil total carbon and nitrogen. And then the fact that both trees and shrubs have an effect on concentrating um, soil, nit soil um, carbon and nitrogen below the canopies in the long term. And what that, yeah, in the long term, so what that means in the short term, sorry. Um, so going forward, um, we still want to be looking at soil infiltration rates, not just hydrophobicity, but how does burning actually affect the rate at which water for example, rainfall would, penet would penetrate and infiltrate into the soils. Soil compaction with and without herbivores. Soil respiration, so some of the stuff Mary was talking about. And then, like I said, the need to differentiate between the different kinds of carbon and nitrogen. So I'd just like to acknowledge the Scientific Services Fire Team because there's no way we can maintain almost a seven-decade fire experiment without a dedicated team to uh, maintain this, and then also some of the um, colleagues and students that have been helping me with um, some of this field work. So, um, I now showed you lots of pictures of flames and fires and all that, so I thought I would not end with another picture of any flames. Or would I? <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one question. Does anyone want to know the name of that fire, of that fire, <laughs> of that flower? I'm sure some of you guys do know. Francie, <laughs> do you have a question or you want to tell them the name of the flower? <laughs> yes. Hi. It's a Gloriosa, probably Gloriosa Superba. That's the one, Gloriosa Superba. It's called a flame lily. So I did show you flames in the, in the end. <laughs> okay, um, okay thank you so much. Time is unfortunately up. You can catch Tertia at lunchtime and we will break for lunch now. <laughs>